Everybody is ready to go? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, uh, in the name of God, the most uh, merciful, most gracious. Uh, in behalf of, uh, uh, on behalf of my uh, co-chairman, uh, Dr. Krazer, and all the um, uh, dear speakers, and the organizer and myself, we would like, it's really my great uh, pleasure and honor to welcome all of you to this uh, special edition of uh, 40S and uh, COVID. Uh, all of us in the last few months, we witnessed this uh, catastrophic uh, uh, problem we have, which affect uh, our health in general our, and our heart in particular. And uh, we felt it's uh, so many informations and report and concern and questions. Uh, we felt it's really, um, we need to, to do a special edition to, about COVID, uh, waiting for the schedule 40th of mid-February will be too long. So we have a little bit of discussion and we thought it's a, it's a good idea to do this uh, special session or special edition of uh, 40S and, and COVID. Um, the story with COVID, as, as you know, it is a very little uh, creature, uh, which is, you cannot see. You can even see with microscope and you have to go to electronic microscope to be able to see it. This uh, little creature actually put the whole world on a on hold. Um, it's uh, it was uh, uh, they estimated that only one gram of this virus did the whole thing and the, did the whole effect on the whole world. For the first time ever, the whole commercial airline were grounded. Uh, most of the car around the world will put in the garage. The busiest street in the world were empty. Um, they estimated more than 3 billion people around the world. They um, locked down at their home, uh, no visitation. It was really very uh, serious um, catastrophe affecting the whole world from far east to far west. Um, So far, uh, there's about, up to last night, there was 20.6 million confirmed uh, case of uh, COVID worldwide, 12.8 million recovered, and uh, 749,000 people died from COVID. So uh, it is very, uh, I mean, a huge, uh, pandemic with significant impact uh, on uh, human life in addition to, to all the life actually. Uh, the economy, individual economy and uh, financial economy to the countries and individual. Now to put that, uh, need to just remember that uh, cardiovascular death in the same corona pandemic period was about 9 million deaths. So remember in the COVID so far, we have less than a million. We have about 800,000. Now we have 9 million deaths from cardiovascular disease. So if you want to make it during Corona pandemic, every two minutes, I'm sorry, every minute two people die from COVID. In the same minute, 26 people die from cardiovascular disease. Just to keep that in mind. I know everybody in the world were so, kind of uh, alerted about uh, the COVID things and everybody take all the precaution needed to avoid COVID. But I think we have still a huge room for improvement to take care of and prevent the cardiovascular disease. It's still about 10 to 15 times death from cardiovascular disease uh, more than COVID. Um, in this uh, meeting, uh, uh, we, I mean, yesterday we maxed up on, on the registration and now we have the YouTube link for people who want to add on. And I think we have more than 600 people already there. Uh, all the talks will be recorded and it will be put on the website of 40S, uh, www.40sconference.com. The CME accreditation uh, was applied for, but we don't, uh, didn't, accredit, didn't uh, confirm yet. 
uh, but will be certificate of attendance. Uh, enjoy the meeting and uh, we'll um, uh, hopefully you have a great informative, um, interesting meeting tonight. Thank you very much for being here. I think uh, Dr. Annie probably going to introduce the next All right. speaker. All right, um, the next speaker uh, is gonna be one of the most favorite people in the world for me, Dr. Zvonimir Krasier. And um, let's see here. All right, good. So Dr. Krasier, um, he hails, um, of course, from Croatia, and but he has been in Houston, Texas for so many years. And I don't have to look at his CV because I know that he's an, an amazing man, um, uh, researcher, uh, teacher, um, very near and dear to my heart. And he started this uh, International Society of Endovascular Specialists. And world over, he's taught so many of you who are on the call and so many who want to be taught by him uh, from the Texas Heart Institute. So I uh, heartily welcome Dr. Krasier to the meeting. and. Um, he is going to uh, speak about uh, coagulation abnormalities in COVID patients, D-dimer, and troponin elevation, what to do about it. Dr. Krasier, please take the wheel. <clears throat> Thank you, Annie, for this uh, great introduction. Uh, I, it is my, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. It is my special pleasure to uh, partner again with uh, four T's uh, and uh, program director. Dr. Omar Halek, uh, who's a great friend of mine and uh, extremely uh, visionary individual as far as um, what needs to be done in uh, uh, United Arab Emirates for education. And we have been very successful in uh, <clears throat> doing this through uh, 4T's uh, uh, program. So uh, as Dr. Halek mentioned, this is very appropriate to discuss at the present time. Uh, COVID-19 and impact of COVID-19 on cardiovascular diseases. The topic of my presentation today is uh, coagulation abnormalities, D-dimer and troponin elevations in COVID-19, what to do about it. Now to set the stage for uh, all the things that uh, we will discuss today, I wanted to start with a publication that was uh, published in the uh, JAMA Cardiology on March 27, 2020, by one of our former uh, graduates from Texas Heart Institute Fellowship Program, Mohammed Majid, uh, who is here in Houston. And he basically at that point of time in very early stages of COVID reviewed all the available literature and summarized uh, all the effects of uh, the COVID-19 on, on the cardiovascular system. And as we can see on this uh, diagram, schematic representation, we can see that there is direct vascular infection. There's systemic uh, pro-inflammatory stimulation, uh, uh, particularly in cytokine storm, hypercoagulability, sympathetic stimulation, myocarditis, uh, direct myocardial infection. All of those can lead to myocardial infarction risk, uh, heart failure risk, and uh, significant uh, arrhythmias. Now, to set the stage for the pre next presentation, uh, let's start with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and how does it work and how does it affect uh, uh, our uh, body and uh, cause problems such as thrombosis. We know that SARS-CoV-2 has a special affinity to ACE2 receptors, and this is the mechanism how it enters into the cell. Uh, those receptors are abundantly present in the respiratory tract, Vessels throughout our body, arteries uh, and veins and microvasculature, extensively present also in myocardium and adipose tissues and many, many organs. And all of this uh, leads to a very aggressive inflammatory reaction that uh, increases the inflammatory markers such as interleukins one and six, tissue necrotic factor. And then this stimulates uh, plasminogen activator inhibitor one, and all of those have effect on the stimulating the cytokine storm when uh, actually uh, the inflammatory response is excessive. And that obviously leads to uh, many, many problems, but one of them is endothelial dysfunction that stimulates uh, coagulation uh, cascade, platelet activation, and uh, fibrin deposit 
in the vessels that leads to thrombosis. Now, uh, as far as uh, arterial and venous thrombosis is concerned, uh, we can see here on this uh, particular presentation that cumulative incidence of uh, venous and arterial and thrombosis events uh, in COVID-19 can be uh, above 30% uh, in our patients. And that could manifest itself as pulmonary emboli, either macro or microemboli, clotting over the central venous line and CVVHD lines, myocardial infarction, uh, stroke, uh, DVT, uh, and VT can occur in spite of prophylaxis that has been clearly shown. And then the worst scenario is disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. Now he, we can see from one of the publications, the effect of heparin on the incidence of mortality and obviously related to thrombosis, whether you are receiving heparin or not receiving heparin. We can see that the heparin non-users have a significantly higher mortality than heparin users, but even with heparin treatment, the mortality is uh, prohibitively high. So let's talk a little bit about cardiac troponin and COVID-19. We know that uh, cardiac thromponin uh, increase is common in COVID-19 patients. Uh, it's more common in patients with chronic cardiovascular disease and also indicates severe COVID uh, inflammatory response, and it definitely has adverse prognosis. Elevated troponin can be classified as acute non-ischemic myocardial injury, as has been shown in uh, Mohammed Majid's uh, publication, but also uh, as chronic myocardial injury and also as an acute MI. Now, uh, as far as predictors of the worst outcome with COVID-19 are elevated fibrinogen and elevated D-dimer of more than 1,000, which will indicate worse outcome and definitely need for admission if this patient is being treated on outpatient basis. DIC has definitely worse outcomes and uh, indicates worse severity. And uh, in those type of scenarios, we need to do a testing frequently and look at the if there is daily rising and then treat patients appropriately. So what are current recommendations for anticoagulant use for COVID-19 patients? All hospital patients should receive pharmacologic prophylaxis uh, according to the risk stratification with anticoagulants. On admission, we should change from DOAC to vitamin K uh, inhibitors, antagonists, and also in certain scenarios to low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated heparin. That is very important because it has been shown that DOACs are not effective in this type of scenario. So if the creatinine clearance is low, then we should avoid low molecular weight heparin and uh, use unfractionated heparin. Uh, when we have, as I mentioned before, elevated D-dimer and multi-organ failure then we need to give a therapeutic doses of either low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin, depending on the creatinine clearance. You should also consider post-discharge prophylaxis for at least four to six weeks, because there has been evidence from previous publications that the thrombosis can reoccur in patients that were discharged and relatively stable on their discharge. Now, for uh, troponin elevation, as far as mechanism is concerned, one interesting thing is uh, as far as acute non-ischemic myocardial injury is concerned, that it, as we mentioned before, can manifest itself as myocarditis. Also, stress cardiomyopathy, acute heart failure, uh, critical illness can also cause troponin elevation. We have to be aware of that. Acute PE as well and sepsis. So not all troponin elevations are due to uh, acute MI and we should pay attention to this. So the question is how to stratify those patients. We know that the increased risk of acute thrombosis uh, is high with those patients that have elevated uh, troponin. And uh, this is obviously in part due to proagulant activity and prothrombotic uh, activity. This is particularly important for patients that have a history of uh, a hypercoagulable syndrome. And we know there are many of them. One of the most common is factor five Leiden deficiency. Now, higher myocardial oxygen supply and demand mismatch 
uh, due to release of uh, inflammatory markers and catecholamines and hypoxia, acidosis, hi hypertension or hypotension can also play a significant role as far as the outcomes of COVID-19 infection. Now, one important thing is, so what to do in patients that have elevated troponin? Do we proceed with imaging? And when do we proceed with imaging? Now, it has been shown in very early experiences uh, from uh, Chinese investigators and also from European investigators, particularly from Italy and France that were the earliest affected with this condition, that up to 40% of patients with elevated troponin do not have a culprit lesion or culprit vessel. And there was no need for uh, intervention for PCI. So it means that not all patients need it. Now, that also adds uh, uh, importance to how to stratify and triage those patients because we know that uh, patients that are affected with COVID can actually spread the infection in the cath lab and other investigation facilities. And therefore, we should avoid transferring the patients to those units when it's not absolutely necessary because we also expose our personnel to COVID-19 infection. So uh, we should manage those patients with serial management and uh, risk stratification depending on patient's condition. And those that have a rapidly rising troponins, obviously, and classical features of uh, acute MI should be treated accordingly depending on uh, existing recommendations. But those patients that are relatively stable and do not have increasing troponin levels should be treated conservatively. So thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you, Dr. Krasier. Excellent um, opening talk for us in this uh, COVID-19 crisis um, worldwide conference. Um, I thought it was, um, uh, very, very thorough, and I'm sure that um, uh, Dr. Halleck may have uh, some comments on this or one of our panelists. And please unmute yourself when you talk so that we can hear you. Remember to unmute yourself. Thank you so much, Dr. Krasier, for this amazing uh, presentation. And uh, always, as always, there's a very uh, rich lecture uh, with uh, very um, up to date information. It's kind of, uh, it was kind of troubling sometime in the beginning when you have a troponin and a slight rising, like troponin probably 10 times or 15 times, uh, patients have some atypical, most of those patients have some atypical chest discomfort and uh, the ECG may, may not show some non-specific ECG changes. Um, so is there a particular, uh, of course, as you said, that uh, there is so many different reasons for the troponin to be elevated. But I think at the end of the day, those end up with myocardial cell damage. Is it because the PE or some other things is only come from the heart, right? I mean, those troponin come from the heart uh, because of PE or because of uh, myocardial injury or ischemia or non-ischemia. I guess there is uh, some cell damage to the heart. Uh, when when do you start? When do you have to have an echo? Any particular? things that you want to do, echo, um, any criteria have to echo, done an echo, because the risk of doing echo unnecessarily is also a problem. Right, so this is a very, <laughs> very important question. Uh, and uh, I think that the echo should be done on admission immediately so we can look at the ejection fraction and follow it uh, sequentially. Now, the thing is uh, what we have already experienced uh, at our institution and many other institutions, we do not want to expose uh, echo personnel and uh, exactly. echo uh, interpretation uh, to COVID. So we uh, train our nurses to obtain in a simple way echo and uh, this way we can assess not only the ejection fraction, but we can also see if there is a pericarditis or pericardial uh, effusion, which is not uncommon in certain subsets of patients, and it could be the cause of ST segment uh, elevation. Now, what is, uh, what is interesting also is there has been a, a study ongoing in the United States uh, using uh, uh, CT uh, coronary angiography in stratifying and screening the patients, uh, whether they need uh, uh, intervention or not intervention or coronary and geographic imaging. And it has been in preliminary fashion shown uh, using a FFR, 
uh, that uh, is a very reliable way of uh, stratifying or triaging the patients who needs it, who doesn't need the intervention and then geography. Excellent. Thank you that's so much. That's, uh, that's amazing. There was actually, interestingly, uh, we have a many young patient in their early 20s. They have S EKG shows ST elevation exactly as MI. I mean, really very uh, significant ST elevation in, in, uh, in either inferior, mostly we see it in inferior leads with slight elevation of troponin, uh, echocardiogram completely normal. And uh, some of them end up with CT angio, just to be sure, because uh, we don't really think that uh, with significant ST elevation and no segmental wall um, have uh, an acute uh, thrombotic event. And um, I was just looking at the things yesterday, there was a quite a few report, uh, a very exact ST elevation criteria for ECG with normal coronary. And uh, CCT angio become very handy for those uh, questionable cases, especially if there's no segmental wall motion abnormality. So some kind of uh, myocardial injury uh, mimic the STEMI, but without occlusion of the coronary. Correct. Uh, so it has been shown, and we know that clearly, that uh, COVID affects microvasculature. And actually, when you have a CVA stroke, Typically, it's not a major vessel occlusion, but a microvascular disease. Similarly, exactly. it can happen in the heart and many other organs. So we have to think of that. And actually, uh, AC2 receptors are probably more abundantly present in microvasculature than in major vessels. And maybe this is the case of what happens to children that develop COVID and have a typical hand finger uh, effects of uh, COVID. And that's obviously the effect on microvasculature. That's right, yeah. Probably there's quite a few questions. Probably we'll, we'll try to keep some to the end because uh, we want to be sure that the other speakers uh, kind of uh, be on time. There's quite a few uh, questions about the uh, ARBs uh, for the COVID, uh, other things going on, but I guess we, we may need to proceed with the next speaker and then uh, hopefully in the end we have some, some time to have uh, quite a few um, questions to be answered. Thank you so much. That's a great presentation. Excellent presentation, Dr. Frazier. We will have questions at the end. Um, in honor of time, I think we will move on to our next speaker, um, who is actually Dr. Omar Halak, and uh, he needs no introduction, but um, uh, I will try to, you know, just tell you all over the world that he is an amazing man, director of interventional cardiology at King's College Hospital, uh, London, Dubai, there in Dubai Hills. And um, he is um, the leader of this 40th conference and he has such a passion for education. So Dr. Halika, we, we welcome you uh, to the stage here. Thank you so much, Annie, for the nice introduction. And thank you for all our speakers to be here. And uh, thank you for the audience to, to be with us tonight. Um, my talk is uh, cardiac involvement in the COVID. And uh, Dr. Krasier already probably mentioned 60% uh, of my talk. So it make my life much easier and I try to go through a few slides I have. Of course, uh, I guess all of us learn, uh, we were learning together on this because none of, there's no somebody called expert in this field in the world. Until, uh, until now, there's no, I don't think there's an expert in this uh, business of COVID and heart or COVID itself. There's a lot of uh, kind of people have more data than others, but uh, things change every day. And um, we learning all together uh, day by day of what's going on. And uh, we find out from statistics that uh, um, uh, COVID uh, in fact, more on the older patient especially male um, with medical comorbidity, pulmonary, cardiac, kidney, uh, or diabetes and cancer. Uh, tend to be about 20% of patients uh, need to be hospitalized, but vast majority of other patients, about 80%, they are mi minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic. The one who end up in hospital, about 20% of them end up in ICU. Uh, so about total of 4% of total infected people end up in ICU. Um, the cardiac involvement uh, tend to be more common on those patients who have, of course, more uh, inflammatory marker, uh, uh, more of um, the uh, um, lympho uh, lymphopenia, acute kidney, elevated LDL, uh, elevated D-dimer, 
um, of course, that will show up in elevated troponin. And the mortality rate for overall COVID between two to 5%. Uh, however, the one who end up in IC, of course, the mortality is much, much higher than that. So fatality, uh, fatality rate for uh, comorbid patients uh, um, in the patient, if you have cardiovascular disease, the mortality rate up to 10%. The patient have hypertension, 6%. Uh, chronic, renal, uh, chronic pulmonary disease, about 6% diabetic 7% and cancer about 5 to 5.6%. So as you can see, it's about two to three times more or actually up to five times more than the average uh, population. The cardiac involvement, there is really different data. There's quite a few different uh, variation of how often the heart gets infected uh, when patients get infected with COVID. Uh, and there's a really lot of uh, different numbers. Um, one of beta analysis from China for 1,500 patients, they found out about 8%, but there's some report, it shows up to 20%. It really depends if you talk about the whole population or the one who been hospitalized, uh, of course, the rate will be higher, and the one end up in ICU, almost all of them end up with some cardiac um, involvement uh, in their, during their uh, CCU. So on average, about 10 to 20% of hospitalization end up with having some, some kind of cardiac involvement. Uh, what is cardiac involvement? As uh, Dr. Krejer mentioned earlier, it can be myocarditis, myocardial injury with elevated troponin, uh, can, can be uh, pericardial effusion, uh, heart failure, right heart failure, or left heart failure can end up with cardiogenic shock. Um, of course, mention about the uh, embolization, pulmonary embolism, and other uh, systemic embolization. Arrhythmia is common in patient involved in, in cardiac involvement of, cap, of uh, COVID. Uh, also other embolization causing the stroke or peripheral embolization. Um, the etiology or basal mechanism, uh, basal physiology of involvement as mentioned by Dr. Krejer earlier is something new probably with the uh, ACE uh, mediated uh, damage. Uh, hypoxia, uh, cardiac microvascular damage. Uh, not sure if there is any macro embolization to the coronary. I don't think that's the case. Uh, but uh, micro embolization and micro MIs, uh, it can be in situ embolization, in situ uh, thrombosis, thrombus formation, or probably uh, move from different parts of the coronary arteries. Uh, there is a talk later on by Dr. Kadra about endothelial dysfunction and it can be one of other reasons for those micro uh, MIs. Uh, systemic inflammation, uh, cytokinase storm, also it can have significant impact on the heart. Matter of fact, uh, most of the patients who have significant cardiac involvement, they have cytokine storm. Uh, pulmonary embolism and uh, right ventricular strain and failure uh, because it's combination of not only pulmonary embolism, but also the uh, ARDS and pulmonary uh, uh, involvement and pulmonary hypertension. Viral myocarditis, there's a talk from Dr. Kanna later about uh, viral myocarditis. He will say if they find a virus in the myocardium or not, as far as I know, that virus was not seen yet, but we'll, we'll hear from Dr. Uh, Dr. Kanna later. Now, in the beginning of the infection, the dominant picture is viral response phase and later start the um, autoimmune response phase, and both of them kind of play a role in the damaging the, the heart. Um, of course, uh, acute coronary syndrome, um, there's some factors make it supposed to be lower, which is lower air pollution, lower computing stress, and, uh, and so on, but there is other counterbalance which increase the likelihood of acute coronary syndrome, uh, psychological stress, social distancing, uh, less uh, leisure walk or, or uh, exercise, um, a lot, lot of fear of unemployment, uncertainty. Um, also, the other thing is not able to come to emergency room. Um, patients are worried to come to emergency room of, because what about catching COVID? And also, the there was um, the ambulance was busy with with taking the COVID patients. So sometimes the cardiac patient have to wait longer to get the, the ambulance to, to get the emergency room. 
one thing was reported also that uh, there is sensory uh, neuropathy on patients with COVID. Uh, they call it uh, ag agiosia, where the patient lose some sensation uh, and they lose the, the pain sensation in the chest and so on. Of course, this report, they lose the smell and the taste uh, and so on. Uh, but all of those uh, make it uh, more likely to have uh, the, the event and probably mortality outside the hospital. Um, the, there is a study from um, Kaiser from uh, North California, one of the biggest uh, uh, medical group. They have a 21 clinic and 255, uh, 255 clinic and 21 medical center. They review the data from January 2020 to April 14, 2020, comparing the data from a similar time in 2019. And they were reviewing the data for 43 million people. And they found out there was decrease in acute myocardial infarction about 48% during the COVID period. And that was similar for non-STEMI and STEMI. Uh, this will be a little bit of debate about what they call non-STEMI. Um, and they uh, found that people who come into the hospital with the STEMI they have less likelihood to have a pre-existing coronary artery disease and less, less uh, uh, typical risk factor for coronary artery disease. Uh, they have uh, less likely to have a, a previous MI or coronary intervention. And this is a curve they have. Uh, this is a, um, the acute MI in 2020 in, in uh, orange. And this is in uh, red the 2020 in red and orange is 19. And as you can see in March, when they have the first, uh, eight, eight, sorry, late February, when they have the first death from COVID in California, they, uh, and the COVID started to go up so high, they noticed that the drop of STEMI coming to emergency room. And that curve continued to drop until now. And um, compared to 2019, there was about 46% decrease of the STEMI reaching the emergency room. European Society of Cardiology, they did a very interesting survey. They sent a questionnaire to 186,000 uh, contacts and uh, 3,000 of them returned the, the survey from 141 country. And the report says 80% of, of those responders said there is 65% reduction of STEMI arriving to emergency room. Only 3% they said there was increase of STEMI come to emergency room. And 60% uh, of the responders said the STEMI uh, patient uh, presented later than usual the emergency room. And 40% they said they STEMI came too late, actually later than the optimal window for PCI or thrombolytic therapy. And uh, one of the most important risk factor was, or variable was uh, country total lockdown. Those countries, uh, patients have a uh, much delay to come to emergency room. So there was lower presentation rate and delay in the presentation. And uh, the European Society of Cardiology, they send a kind of, a, they did a press release regarding the uh, fear of contact, uh, con con contracting uh, COVID from hospital. They said the COVID mortality is 10 times lower than that of an untreated heart attack and rapid treatment of heart attack work. So uh, um, if you worry from getting COVID, in the hospital, your chance to die at home 10 times higher than dying from the COVID. Now, uh, for myocarditis, uh, as I said, uh, will be Dr. Kanna will talk about myocarditis and uh, Dr. Krejer mentioned earlier about the mechanism usually associated with the uh, um, cytokine storm, uh, the fulminant myocarditis. I see it in the patients who are younger. Uh, they have more of the myocarditis than older patients and they do respond well to the steroid. Uh, we try that for, I mean, since um, early in the course of COVID, uh, because we have nothing else to do and we kept steroid and it really worked. Uh, that was really early in, in, in March, we started using the steroid for, for myocarditis. 
there was a risk of using it, but um, there was nothing else to do. And uh, there was a report of uh, cardiac tamponade with uh, major pericardial effusion. Some of them, they did MRI, but I don't think that was a practical to diagnose myocardial, uh, somebody who is really sick with myocarditis to send for, for cardiac MRI. Heart failure, uh, the patient come into emergency to intensive care unit. Uh, there are studies to suggest about a third of them end up with uh, heart failure. Um, right heart failure also common, probably more common than the left heart failure. And we noted that there is a dilatation of the right ventricle commonly on those patients. And um, probably multiple etiology, the ischemia, the hypoxia, the ARDS and the pulmonary embolism. I don't know whether there's something else why make the right failure also more likely to get involved, but probably the pulmonary uh, factor is, is uh, contributing to worsening and more common right ventricular failure than uh, right uh, on left uh, failure. And um, for the left uh, heart failure and uh, cardiogenic shock, the FDA on April 6th, uh, they issue a guidance for expanding the availability of ECMO for those patients with COVID and uh, also approve the long duration of ECMO for those patients. And also on uh, June 1st, they approve a right-sided umbrella device for right heart failure. And it seemed to be a very effective way for uh, bridging the patient with, heart, with, with right heart failure especially after able to control the thrombosis and uh, the, the hypoxia. Arrhythmia is common with heart failure, with the cardiac involvement of uh, COVID. And um, the mechanism is, is multiple, it, it's cardiac injury. Uh, as mentioned earlier, with elevated troponin, almost everybody coming into intensive care unit, they have elevated troponin and D-dimer. And so that indicator of some myocardial damage and uh, triggering arrhythmia. Of course, hypoxia, um, high, uh, hyper uh, acute uh, systemic inflammation, uh, and in addition to, of course, all of us know about the story of medication and the chloroquine story. I guess I have a slide on that one. Um, there is, of course, there is a uh, estimated about 16% of patients uh, hospitalized end up with having arrhythmia. And it, is, it was noted that the patient with uh, COVID uh, involvement of the heart, they have hypokalemia, and it probably due to the effect on the rest system. Uh, cytokine uh, storm, where there is severe immune reaction uh, in the body, I think is more common in young patients. There's too many cytokines too quickly uh, released to the blood, and that end up with complication for multi-organ failure, uh, associated with higher risk of having a stroke or uh, MI or myocarditis, heart failure and kidney failure and all, all other uh, uh, multi-organ damage. And this is a, a worse outcome. They do respond uh, somewhat well to the steroid, but the mortality rate is still high. A uh, patient become tachycardic, the kidney, diaphoretic, um, all of them have elevated D-dimer and uh, they, many of them end up with renal failure requiring um, renal replacement therapy. Uh, as mentioned earlier, a thrombosis everywhere, including the lungs, and uh, it's not uncommon to see uh, actually macro pulmonary embolism, uh, but probably all patients come into intensive care and they have some elevated D-dimer, indicating some kind of probably microembolization either to the lungs or, or thrombosis somewhere else. Uh, but uh, the thrombosis is very common, and Dr. Kreger mentioned the benefit of anticoagulation. And uh, as he mentioned that uh, uh, NOAC does not work in these patients. Matter of fact, I have a patient who was put on NOAC um, uh, in COVID, uh, but after discharge, she has a superficial, superficial vein thrombosis. I don't know if it's related to using the NOAC or it was kind of weird case that after she recovered completely from COVID, she developed a uh, vein thrombosis and it has put her on, uh, on uh, Clixan, low molecular weight heparin. So, um, so adding to the problem to the patient with, uh, with uh, ARDS, they will have uh, acute uh, thrombosis for pulmonary and uh, microembolism and macroembolism. 
and of course that will uh, worsen their their course. A stroke, as mentioned earlier, also it can be ischemic stroke. Uh, about 15% of patients with COVID end up with an ICU, and there is a 6% they have hemorrhagic stroke. Probably um, the transport, transformation of the ischemic stroke or or just uh, something else going on, we don't know yet. And there was a report of cerebral venous thrombosis in patients with COVID. Uh, you all of uh, us, we know about the chloroquine, st uh, chlor um, uh, chloroquine uh, story with COVID, um, initial uh, small report, so it's beneficial to the patient with uh, COVID and especially with the uh, combination with adithromycin, but turned to be that will cause, as we know, increase the uh, QT prolongation, and there was increased mortality after using that chloroquine. And uh, then FDA announced that uh, this should not be used uh, except for uh, under a, a research um, protocol. There was a lot of political things about the chloroquine, and as you all of you know that uh, President Trump, they said, well, this is a magic medicine going to, to help the COVID. But uh, later on turned to be, uh, it is very dangerous to the patient. Uh, in summary, uh, during COVID pandemic, more people will die from cardiovascular disease then from COVID, probably 10 times more. Cardiovascular disease or risk factor for cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, and so on, they increase the risk of getting infected with COVID and they will have worse outcome. Hypercoagulated state with the thrombosis embolization are common in hospitalized patients with COVID. Acute coronary syndrome, myocarditis, pericarditis, arrhythmia, heart failure, and shock, all possible complications of COVID. Cytokine storm associated with multi organ damage and may response to steroid. Thank you very much. Dr. Halleck, thank you so much for that all-inclusive uh, overview of uh, COVID in the heart. And um, I've given the leaders uh, of the conference a lot of time to talk, and now we're going to be a little bit more, uh, I'm gonna rein in everyone who goes, uh, uh, you get 10 minutes to really educate us. And so we thank you um, for all of that, our great leaders. Now we're gonna go to our next set of speakers. Um, the next speaker is Dr. Kana. Dr. Kana, I met him um, at our wonderful conference there at 4TS. He's a, a leader in India uh, with the Apollo Group of Hospitals and he has his own conference there in New Delhi, I believe. Um, he has a wonderful talk for us about um, uh, COVID and myocarditis. Uh, Dr. Kana, uh, welcome to our stage. Please unmute yourself and remember, everyone take 10 minutes and we'll, we may have to hold questions to the end. Let's see how it goes. All right, Dr. Kana. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Annie. Thank you, Dr. Halak and, and Dr. Fraser. It's been a great pleasure to be invited and to be speaking in this uh, conference. And very quickly, it's been, uh, on the topic of COVID. Uh, just to, uh, I mean, I would uh, have a request that I would have to leave after my presentation because my own uh, uh, partner is down and admitted in the ICU with COVID-19 and she's got a daughter who's one and a half years old. And I need to go and attend to her. And another of my colleagues is also a cardiologist at ICU and is uh, ongoing. It is a very bad disease. And it's uh, actually, uh, uh, we are the most vulnerable persons to actually be dealing with this complication. And the stage is already set by Dr. Fraser and Dr. Halak. Uh, about 30% of uh, patients uh, who have COVID actually come to the hospital with severe myocarditis. With severe cardiovascular involvement, which could be myocarditis, acute coronary syndromes, venous pericarditis, myocarditis, or uh, you know uh, venous thrombosis and thromboembolism, apart from strokes and induced uh, issues. So this is a very common disease, and doc, as Dr. Halak said, if you don't treat this, uh, you would probably have more chances of dying because of cardiac issues of COVID and COVID itself. I'll keep my topic uh, very uh, small and we'll just go with a, a small case report and uh, a brief about myocarditis in COVID. 
we have an experience now of treating 1200 patients in our hospital and india as you know is the fourth largest in num- in terms of numbers in the, in the in the in the in the world and every day we are getting about 50000 new patients in the country and our hospital, all the hospitals in the country are actually facing uh, this kind of disease now uh, coming on to the covid 19 uh, uh, in patients with cardiovascular disease uh, this dr hallak has already uh, alluded on this a report from nsc of china reported that 12% of patients without known cardiovascular disease had elevated levels of uh, troponin and and had cardiac arrest during hospitalization so this actually led to a suspicion that there would be a direct myocardial injury Uh, or arrhythmia leading uh, to this death and people who died from covid-19 reported by the nsc 11.8% of these patients did not have underlying coronary, uh, cardiovascular disease but had substantial uh, heart damage uh, on autopsy and their cardiac uh, uh, troponin levels were uh, increased and they had cardiac arrest during hospitalization so again this uh, actually set the stage that there could be a direct myocardial infarction Uh, myocardial uh, damage by the covid-19 uh, uh, virus and this was substantiated by the autopsy reports from germany so uh, this uh, led to a suspicion that actually uh, this could be a direct myocardial involvement leading to myocarditis or cardiomyopathy and this was again substantiated in united states in some areas they found higher incidences of uh, Uh, normal uh, of cardiac uh, arrest and also coronary vascularity leading to syndromes like tragosubo uh, tragosubo cardiomyopathy and also cardiac disease so how uh, it uh, i mean how this to covid virus binds to as to a little this this explain dr fraser and what it does it directly binds to the ace2 receptors which are highly expressed both in the coronary endothelium and the myocardium parts in the lung uh, uh, tissue as well as the brain and there is also an increased pro inflammatory uh, cytokines uh, release and this leads to a systemic inflammation both together actually damage the myocardium and depress the myocardial function and this leads to a severe form of this called Uh, again uh, the sars uh, cov2 virus binds to the ace2 receptors causing the activation of cytokine by tmprss2 and uh, what happens is the myocardial injury is uh, it gets into the myocardium myocardial cells and uh, it leads to uh, intense inflammation and this is sort of uh, evidenced by increase in the cardiac biomarkers which was recognized as very early in the world as as early as in january and the myocardial injury can actually uh, present like a myocardial infarction again as uh, dr black said and dr fraser said 30% of the patient did would have a st elevation mi mimic i mean to do their coronary angiogram find that they have non obstructive thrombotic lesions of coronary artery and this is because of the myocardial injury in association with coronary uh, thrombosis and uh, uh, we can have uh, normally we have uh, increased pro inflammatory markers like increase in rh6 the timer ferritin and ldh and uh, uh, this uh, also is accompanied by increased high levels of high sensitivity cardiac troponin which was seen in the initial reports of, of Forty-one patients of COVID-19 in Wuhan, where five patients had raised their high-risk activity cardiac troponin levels more than 28 milligrams per ml. And again, uh, uh, it was seen that patients who went into uh, in ICU and required uh, ICU support and ventilation and cardiac support actually had much higher levels of uh, these markers, both the treatment times and so on. So again. the emphasis was that there is a direct myocardial injury in this patient of course the myocardial injury could be uh, increased and substantiated by cytokine storm by acute coronary syndrome because of acute coronary occlusions by ace mediated viral infiltrate 
attached and directly into the myocardium and leading to myocarditis and sometimes also by the drugs which we are using to treat uh, this infection. So with this uh, background, I'm presenting uh, one representative cases, uh, case uh, about uh, just to give you a brief about six to seven percent of uh, the patients in our series actually had uh, myocardial and myocardial involvement in terms of cardiomyopathy or myocarditis. So this is a 35 year old male who presented with fever, which was 102 degrees Fahrenheit for two days before admission. Also presented with shortness of breath for one day with a low saturation of 89%. And the patient had uh, atypical chest pain, which was almost typical uh, of peripheral pain. And his RT PCR for COVID 19 virus was positive. This was the ECG, which showed, uh, ST, which showed ST elevation, uh, uh, suggestive of uh, uh, pericarditis, and uh, also we have ruled out syndrome in these patients because these were generalized changes in all the leads. And uh, in terms of uh, the biochemical uh, and the blood uh, labs, uh, the CBC was normal, the CRP was 20, the D dimer was 886, the interleukin 6 was 156, and HS profile was 55,000, uh, 5,500. If you see, uh, we did a trans uh, thoracic echo in an emergency department. We have a dedicated machine uh, for doing these COVID patients uh, and a dedicated personnel to do the COVID echocardiograms. Uh, what we find here is the LV function is depressed and there is a pericardial effusion. Uh, and this is the four chamber view uh, showing the same with depressed uh, LV ejection fraction, generalized global echocardiogram and pericardial effusion. The patient uh, was actually treated by decongestive therapy, also had a CT protein CT scan, which showed infiltrates in the lungs, typical of COVID pneumonia. And also the MRI, which was done a little later, not at the uh, time of the admission, when the patient was slightly better, which shows inflammation in the myocardium and uh, also update in the uh, uh, myocardium. Dr. Kana, two minutes, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, the patient was treated by decongestive uh, therapy, which is standard, was also treated by exomethasone and remdesivir. And this was the echo, which was done after day seven, uh, showed a slight improvement in the myocardial um, functions. And the patient was had a, maintained the saturation on one liter of oxygen, above 95%. So this is, these are representative, representative patients. Most of them, if diagnosed early, can actually be treated aggressively and can, uh, uh, can have good outcomes, but some of them actually decompensate and require left ventricular access devices, and sometimes they have, uh, you know, cardiac arrest and intractable uh, failures and recurrent cardiac arrest. In short, uh, the way we treat is, uh, is if you have COVID-19 patients who are suspected to be having myocarditis, we must do a routine ECG enzymes, inflammatory markers, and also transthoracic echo. If the patient is stable, the patient can have a CP coronary angiogram or a contrast or, a, or, a, or a, uh, you know, a MRI. And uh, if the patient uh, cannot tolerate that, we have a presumptive diagnosis of uh, you know, myocarditis and treat them with the usual therapy. There should be uh, no, uh, you know, reservation in treating these patients as we treat the uh, patients uh, in terms of heart failure and cardiac disease devices. Most of them do very well. And it's not good to use uh, QT prolongation drugs. It can do a, you know, it can increase the QT interval, especially the antimalarials like chloroquine or uh, uh, drugs like retinovir uh, or lopinovir or uh, azithromycin. And many a times we also avoid uh, and, uh, you know, NSAIDs because what they do is they increase the sodium retention and increases the heart failure. We tend to avoid this and also tend to avoid uh, negative anotropic agents. Thank you very much. I'm going to be stopping here for the uh, possibility of time. And uh, I also need to uh, take your permission uh, from the chairperson, Dr. Kaiser, and Dr. Uh, to actually go and attend uh, our colleagues who are admitted in the hospital.
Dr. Kanawi, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions currently, and we wish you all the best, and we pray for your colleagues there in India. So the next presenter will be um, Dr. Abdullah Shahab, and I believe he is there with us. Uh, Dr. Shahab, you can get ready. Um, he's um, an amazing educator there in the UAE, and we're so happy to have him with us. He's also, um, I believe, the uh, chief editor uh, of the Emirates uh, Medical Journal. And so um, many of our four TS uh, data will be in there, we hope. So uh, Dr. Shahab, take it away. Assalamualaikum. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. And uh, uh, great to see you, Dr. Omar, Dr. Bejar, and Thanks, everyone. Sir. All the colleagues uh, healthy and good uh, to see you really yeah. virtual. I think everyone's virtual nowadays, so I think it's nice to see you. Right, as as the chief editor of the New America Journal, you know, I had the privilege to really meet most of the societies in the country, starting from cardiac society to intensive care, ER, family medicine, microbiology. I have a, a great kind of, you know, uh, experience of what they've been doing in the country. I'll maybe discuss that later on. But I'll give you a, a, a glimpse of, you know, what um, a case of um, acute coronary syndrome, which uh, represents type 1 among the COVID in the country, 50% type 1. 15% um, of our uh, COVID cases uh, had, you know, were young, and um, they had a lot of throm thrombus uh, burden, you know, which really I think is... Uh, made everyone uh, to, to, to know, to go to the basics, what, how to manage that patients. And then we had, of course, uh, other type, which we will discuss at the end, inshallah. So I'm gonna get, take you a, a, through a, a very simple case. Um, let's see. So the 55 years old, uh, diabetic, hypertensive, dyslipidemic. You see, these patients are at risk. We know, we already, Dr. Omar, Dr. Christian mentioned, these are the patients who, are, if they get COVID, they have very bad outcome. And this is uh, happened uh, with this patient. Basically, you know, he said he developed um, a kind of um, a short of breath uh, for a week and then uh, came with um, uh, chest pain for two days. And, um, you know, we look at his ECG, um, you can see it's still elevation. Uh, we don't know is this is really right coronary, LCX, something else going on. We don't know. And um, at the beginning, this was actually in March. You know, this case was in March. You know, some, some of our experience, uh, similar to China at the beginning, we used to take patients like this, thrombolize them, uh, because, you know, we worried every patient, especially like this patient, you know, uh, potential of having COVID-19. Uh, but anyway, this hospital uh, say, no, we will go with primary PCI. And this is what uh, was the case. This patient had a chest X-ray, you can see, again, consistent with, uh, with you know, th that co concern we have, COVID-19. Um, so this patient, basically, you know, uh, we worried about the saturation. It was electively intubated because this hospital was ready for, you know, pathway for COVID and non-COVID uh, cases. So this int electively intubated, um, taken to the hospital, uh, to the cath lab, you know, uh, and path, you know, this uh, had brilliant actually this, this patient and loaded with uh, heparin and uh, aspirin. A radial axis, um, um, and and during the, the this is right coronary. You can see it's uh, free. I mean, a bit of disease. Actually, you can see like uh, uh, six seventy. You know, uh, osteal there, and uh, uh, not really. I, we don't think that's the culprit. So uh, we looked at the at the. Oops, I can't. Okay, you can see is that LCX is, is thrombotic. You know, so it's fresh. Some plaque ruptures. That's the, that's the, that's the reason. So straightforward, you know, you know, wired, ballooned. Um, you can see lots of thrombus going downstream here. Um, then it was stented with um, um, 3.5 by uh, by uh, uh, 20 um, uh, regulating stent, and you can see lots of thrombus going downstream. And you can see uh, previously, and this is was the um, the result. So a patient uh, had during the this procedure uh, just to know. Uh, blood pressure going down, so it become like cardiogenic shock, not responded to dopamine, dobutamine. He had to have intraortic balloon, uh, which, you know, we, we don't know the, 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 the importance of that. But anyway, we don't use it actually anymore, but that we had to do that in that case. Patient then after, you know, came back to the result same day, was positive, COVID positive. Anyway, that everyone taking their precaution, PPE was there, every, we had the pathway, everyone, everything was in, 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 in the right way. 
a patient uh, was extubated after three days, then actually deteriorated again. Patient, this, you know, shown to have um, COVID-19 pneumonia with respiratory failure. Uh, after, you know, this was 23rd of, of, of March. On 29th of March, he had the echo. You know, that's a delay of echo happened because again, people are worried to, you know, uh, no necessary to do echo unless it's, you know, the patient is getting worse. So we did the echo, injection fraction was about 35, 40. We were not intending to do right coronary because that was, we said, medical treatments enough for that case. Uh, patient, uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, the, the, the troponin went to like 700 and the CRP 200, uh, fibrinogen high, then actually deteriorated the, you know, after that, you know, remain in the, he intubated again, he remained in, in ICU for about one month, tried every uh, medication we use for COVID, you know, all these antibiotics, antiviral, nothing, nothing respond. Patient actually, at the end, um, uh, we, we lost the patient. So this was an example of, you know, of, of a COVID, which was a bad outcome. But uh, our experience in UAE of uh, the, the, the acute coronary syndrome, STEMI, has been really great. Most of them um, did well. But I had to give you uh, just an example of, you know, uh, bad end. But uh, this is the life. So that was my uh, uh, simple case. I have other cases, but I don't think it's time for that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Abdullah. That was very uh, good uh, case. And uh, kind of uh, we see that uh, you did a great uh, angioplasty, but unfortunately the patient, I think, is too sick from COVID itself. The lungs is, look like very bad, and uh, he's really very sick regarding of his heart condition. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Jihad. I think for our three teachers here um, who have just uh, presented, or four teachers here, um, there is a question. Does history of previous DVT and PE in a young patient add to the risk of cardiovascular complications of getting COVID-19. I'm getting questions here on the Q&A. So I just thought I would present one of these to you all. Would one of you like to answer that? Dr. Uh, Shahab. Sorry, so history of DVT and PE for patient at risk young of what? Patient, COVID? Young patient add to the risk of cardiovascular complication of COVID-19. You know, uh, we've seen this, I mean, I'm sure all of you have seen that. I said 15% of our patients with acute coronary syndrome had other multi-organ. One of them is the thrombosis here and there. Of course, if they have a DVT pulmonary embolism, I'm sure it's, it's make the, the outcome worse. That's what I... Yes. Yeah, especially if they have um, uh, the predisposed to DVT and PE, if they have hypercoagulability state to start with, okay. the COVID infection, uh, they will make them more hypercoagulability and probably they will be at the higher risk of having embolization, I think. Exactly. Thank you both. <laughs> all right. Um, I think our next speaker kind of pulls it um, all together there with what is happening at the endothelium. So talking about endothelial dysfunction, Dr. Walid Kadro. Uh, director of the Golden Center for Advanced Cardiovascular uh, currently, and uh, going to talk about endothelial dysfunction in COVID. Dr. Cadro, uh, take it away. And you need to unmute yourself, sir. Me now. All right, now. Me now. We cannot hear you very well. Can you hear me now? That's better. Can you increase that volume somewhat? Okay. We're all the way in Texas, so we need a little volume. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. Better. Let me share my screen now. Okay, good evening, everybody. Let me thank all the organizers, especially Dr. Halak and Dr. Krajer for uh, the nice invitation for uh, this uh, nice symposium to cover about COVID-19. I'm happy that I'm taking off my hat as an interventional cardiologist and putting uh, a new hat as a vascular biologist and we'll try to cover the uh, topic of uh, endothelial dysfunction. Uh, just let me put on the slideshow. Okay. So everybody knows about the endothelium, about the ves, uh, vessels, and every vessel has adventure and media, media, and has the endothelium. And you know the endothelium is only one layer, but has a lot of uh, function. So uh, the main function of uh, that, apart from protection and maintaining the good flow, 
uh, it work as a, uh, an, as an anticoagulant and prevent the formation of in situ clots and also work as a vasodilator through the production and, uh, of an important substance called nitric oxide. And the nitric oxide is really synthesized in the, in the cereals by converting the arginine uh, to citrulline and uh, adding oxyg uh, oxygen and thus create the nitric oxide. And the nitric oxide has a lot of important function. It, it promotes vasodilation, it uh, uh, increases arterial, com uh, arterial compliance and uh, cause positive remodeling and dilation of the vessel. And also inhibit a lot of bad things like smooth muscle, muscle proliferation and uh, uh, prevent apoptosis of the endothelial cell, prevent thrombosis and prevent uh, platelet uh, activation. Uh, it also uh, prevent the uh, secretion of the uh, tissue factor when it's intact. But however, when it's, uh, uh, the endothelium is really uh, damaged, it uh, releases tissue factor. Also, uh, the nitric oxide prevents inflammation and the production of cytokines. So uh, this is the uh, um, effect of uh, the in, uh, nitric oxide production through the enzyme called uh, endothelial nitric oxide synthesis. And after the production of nitric oxide, it has a lot of good things that uh, promote laminar flow, prevent adhesion of all leukocytes, and prevent activation of pl uh, platelets, and also work through cyclic GMP for uh, a production of uh, the uh, substance that uh, uh, causes smooth muscle relaxation. And uh, uh, with that, uh, th this is the uh, one of the tests that. Uh, what you, I used to do in the CAS lab when I was a fellow, and that's where, uh, this is the baseline, and you see that the vessel is not dilated by uh, really giving acetylcholine infusion, which work, which work through production of nitric oxide cause significant dilation of this complex artery. However, if the nitric oxide is not really bioactive due, due to damage of the endothelium, we'll get all of those things uh, inactivated, so we are not preventing uh, uh, adhesion. So there is more leukocyte adhesion. There is uh, less product, uh, less uh, oxygen delivery. There is uh, uh, increased platelet activation, and there is no vascular uh, muscle uh, effect. And with that, cause vascular muscle contraction and spasm of the uh, vessel. And uh, really, uh, the endothelial dysfunction predict cardiovascular mortality. This is a small study that uh, uh, evaluated the patient who were going for vascular uh, surgery, and they did endothelial function through the brachial artery uh, uh, ultrasound and found that the people who has normal vasodilation uh, uh, in response to uh, acetylcholine has uh, four, almost fourfold uh, protection from uh, cardiovascular event compared to the people who has really uh, a, a bad response to uh, in, uh, uh, dilation. And uh, there is too many uh, studies, uh, of mo uh, most of them are really positive that in the celiac dysfunction uh, predict, predict cardiovascular events. So how now, how do we get in the celiac dysfunction? And uh, the most important thing is the oxidative stress, because if we have uh, really a superoxide and uh, active oxygen uh, uh, species, reactive oxygen species, uh, when it really work uh, and interact with nitric oxide, it produces uh, this substance, which is uh, nitric superoxide. And this uh, uh, chemical activation is really quite fast, uh, happen like a diffusion, and the uh, rate of constant is really high. And a lot of things cause uh, uh, this uh, endothelial dysfunction and uh, uh, impair uh, nitric oxide by activity. Everybody knows about hypercholesterolemia, smoking, uh, diabetes, and hypertension, and coronary artery disease. Now, how this uh, uh, can we interact between the reactive oxygen species and nitric oxide? We know nitric oxide causes vasodilation, platelet. Uh, inhibition, a smooth muscle quiescence, and vasodilation, normal tension, and uh, prevent uh, proliferation. However, if we get uh, reactive oxygen species, we get vasoconstriction thrombosis, smooth muscle hypertrophy, and hypertension, and endothelial cell damage or death. And we know they work against each other. 
Now let's uh, talk about reactive oxygen species. And we know that this oxygen, regular oxygen, if we add an electron to it uh, through uh, an en enzyme, which quite common uh, in the white blood cells, uh, the enzyme, uh, enzyme called uh, uh, NADPH oxidase, and that's produced really superoxide. And let me put this red dot to indicate that really a radical and a, a harmful substance. And if we add another electron, we'll get the hydrogen peroxide. And if we add another electron now, we'll get reduction and we'll get the uh, another uh, really harmful called hydroxy radical. And finally, if we add another electron, we'll end up with the harmless substance of water. Now, how the, uh, our uh, body protect us from that? There is a lot of things. Uh, now, we have an enzyme called superoxide uh, uh, dismutase, which has three uh, subunits, one in the mitochondria, one in the extracellular matrix, and one uh, inside the cytoplasm. And the cofactors for uh, one uh, uh, is uh, zinc, the other cofactor is copper, and the third cofactor is man manganese. And this enzyme uh, takes this superoxide and bring it back to oxygen, and uh, uh, um, uh, oxygen uh, hydroxy peroxide, which is less toxic substance, but still it works as uh, as a killer in the white blood cells. Now the Dr. other Andrew, uh, mechanism. Andrew, Andrew, two minutes, please. Two yeah. minutes. The other mechanism are uh, really uh, the substance of glucothione, and if reduced form, it's really converted to uh, an oxidized form, and that caused this uh, hydrogen peroxide to be converted to water and through an enzyme called glutathione peroxidase. Now, uh, this can recharge again by uh, uh, another uh, sub reductor, redu reducing enzyme called glutathione reductase. Now, with that, also there is another prevention me mechanism through an enzyme called catalase, which really take this Hydrogen peroxide, uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide and convert it back to normal oxygen and back to, to water. This is the normal thing. Now, what's happened if we get increased oxidative activity in, like, in obesity, hypertension, in type 2 diabetes? Now we will go back to what happened here in our uh, COVID patient. We have oxidative stress, and I, we reviewed that. And this go concentrate on this and we'll uh, find that now there is no protection because of the exhausted uh, uh, effect of the superoxidase uh, dismutase and this uh, uh, peroxidase. And what will happen, we know that there is angiotensin II, and angiotensin II is really converted to good substance through an enzyme ACE2, but however, uh, uh, this angiotensin 1,7 also work to suppress the nitric of uh, uh, NADPH oxidase and prevent the production of this bad substance uh, superoxide uh, radical. However, one if minute, we get sir. the SARS-CoV, yeah, this is, we are, this is the last slide. If we get the SARS-CoV, we'll get more inhibition of this S2. So there we are, have now double inhibition. That's mean increase. Uh, activity of NADPH oxidase and increased production of superoxide radical and increased oxidative stress. So this is the summary slide of hypothesis, how we get this bad coagulation. We get SARS-CoV-2 and that will get decrease in S2 activity after the connection, uh, uh, the uh, 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 virus interact with this uh, receptor and this will get uh, increase of angiotensin 2 and decrease of angiotensin 1 7, and that's lead to increase oxygen, uh, reactive oxygen species, and this radical substance, and that's cause endothelial cell dysfunction. And with that, we'll get increased production of bone volume factor from this uh, damaged endothelial, and that will end up with this uh, uh, thrombosis. And that's the mechanism of endothelial dysfunction and why we get in increased thrombosis with COVID-19. Wow, I have a lot of wow. studies, but I think I did reach you the message and thank you very much. I'm really thank happy you. to get any question. Thank you, Dr. Kadro. That was amazing. We all needed to remember about uh, all these pathways and endothelial dysfunction. Unfortunately, we have no time for questions right now, but later, uh, hopefully uh, after, after we finish all of this. Um, thank you so much, sir.
Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Lauren Barron, and she's hailing from the United States, uh, from Waco, Texas. So a great friend of mine who is the professor, lead professor of medical humanities there at Baylor University. I'm honored uh, to be affiliated with her as well as Dr. Halleck and Dr. Tamkeen, all, um, and Dr. Hussein who's with us, uh, all adjunct professors there teaching medical humanities with her. D Dr. Barron, please take it away. Good morning, can you hear me okay? Yes. Greetings from Texas, and I'm so thankful to be able to be here with you today. I am uh, going to be talking about bridging the art and science of training physicians. And uh, I have here a picture of my students on a very important bridge in Waco. It's a suspension bridge over the, um, over the uh, uh, Brazos River. It's called the Brazos de Dios the arms of God. So that's where I'm hailing from uh, actually this morning. So what is medical humanities? Well, it's a bridge between the art and science of medicine that we've been discussing this morning. I also describe it as the best of a liberal arts education with the medical focus. And I also like to say that we're trying to turn medical students into human beings before their medical training turns them into gods uh, robots or zombies, and uh, we, uh, we all have met doctors like that. So that's when I say medical humanities, that's, um, that's what I mean. Um, I want to start with Sir William Osler, some of you may be familiar with. Um, he's famous for his command of the humanities and his insistence that doctors become familiar not only with the science of medicine, but with the humanities as well. And he's considered one of the most influential uh, physicians and one of the most influential speakers in the uh, English speaking world. And uh, as I say that, I'm very conscious that Western medicine is built on a foundation handed to us from our Islamic um, medical brethren. And I want you to know that I teach my students about Razi's and uh, Ibn Sina and Ibn al-Nafis, who we know uh, was before Harvey in discovering the uh, circulation of the heart. And so even though I'm talking about humanities from um, the English speaking tradition, I want to just recognize that, um, that we're building on a tradition handed to us from um, your part of the world. And I'm afraid that goes unrecognized. So I wanted to, uh, to pay my respects um, today. This was Dr. Osler's bedside library for his medical students. Um, he said, start at once a bedside library and spend the last half of the day in communion with the saints of humanity. And these are the, um, the works that he recommended. You can see Plutarch, you can see Shakespeare, the Bible, Don Quixote, uh, some of the uh, classic Roman um, and Greek authors. And so this is what he recommended in addition to the scientific training of his students. Um, this is a speech that he gave uh, called the old humanities and the new sciences. And he talked about for, for physicians to be properly educated to practice their art, knowledge of the science of medicine must be supplemented by familiarity with the humanities. And he also called um, humanities and science twin berries on one stem. And he says that grievous damage has been done to both in regarding the humanities and sciences in any other life than complemental. So what he's saying is we have to view the humanities and sciences not as in competition, but as complemental to each other. I also want to mention, um, if you'd like to do more reading in this area, Dr. Edmund Pellegrino, who said it the most succinctly that medicine is the most scientific of the humanities and the most humane of the sciences. So as physicians, we are right at that intersection of science and the human experience. And so, um, so this is what I spend my life teaching my students that we must excel and we must know as much as we can in the sciences, but um, the humanities is another way to know about, if we're gonna take care of human beings, we need to understand human experience. And how do we do that? We do that through the humanities. So um, in this excellent conference that we've um, had the privilege of attending this morning, we've been looking at COVID through a scientific lens. What is science? We think of objectivity. 
We think of facts, we think of replicable procedures, we think of universal rules that apply to all of our patients, things that we can generalize. And um, science helps give us that biophysical understanding of disease process. But we can't forget the humanities as another source of wisdom and knowledge. Um, when we think of the humanities, we think of subjectivity, we think of stories, the stories that we all listen to of our patients that are idiosyncratic, that are individual, that are unique, that are particular. The fact that multiple truths can exist simultaneously, multiple perspectives. And the humanities can give us an understanding of the biopsychosocial and spiritual understanding of illness as compared with just disease. I wanna mention T.S. Eliot, a famous English author who says, where's the life we've lost in living? Where's the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? Where's the knowledge we've lost in information? I would, um, I would subject to you for your examination that I think what we want most in our physicians, we want our physicians, we want to be wise. And science can help us with knowledge, but for wisdom, we need something even bigger than science and science is big. My corollary that I've added is where's the information we've lost in data and where's the data that we've lost in noise. And I think the humanities can help us cut through the noise, cut through the data. One person has said that um, stories are data with a soul. So I love that, that we need to think of our, our stories as well. Um, I want to mention Dr. Eric Cassell, whose writing has been extremely influential. Um, Dr. Cassell was one of the first to talk about the importance of approaching our patients, not just as patients, but as persons. And I want to quote here um, a, uh, an excerpt from one of his books that I think are so important. Scientific doctors, that's us, who lack developed personal powers are inadequately trained. Another way of wording this is to say that in addition to the tools placed at their disposal by science, which we've talked about today, doctors are themselves instruments of care who must be refined by knowledge and training to be maximally effective. So we've got the tools placed at our disposal by science, but he goes on to say, it's universally accepted that a doctor's education has to continue for a lifetime, just as we're doing today, to keep abreast of advances in medicine. It's less well known, but equally important. And I want to emphasize this, that a physician continually work at refining the instrument of medical care that is himself or herself, the personal power and effectiveness essential to the very best medical care. So we ourselves, I was taught to use a stethoscope as we all were. I was not taught that I myself am the instrument of medical care and that we have to work on our personal powers to be the very best that we can. Um, just science alone will not prepare us well enough to take care of our patients. I'm happy to say that Dr. Eric Cassell is alive and well. Um, he's retired from his practice in New York City. He's 90 years old, he's actively writing um, and he would love to correspond with any of all of you. He's not hard to find on the internet. These are some of the books that I would recommend to you. And I want to point out, as I had to point out to him because he wrote it so long ago, The Place of the Humanities in Medicine was actually his very first monograph that he wrote. So he talks about the significance of the humanities there. And these are among some of his excellent books. I want to quote here the journalist and thinker David Brooks. He came to Baylor University and he made a statement that stopped me in my tracks. We can only act in the world we see. Now, if the only world we see is the world of reductionist science, we're missing out on a massive part of, of experience. So if we only train our, our medical students to see at the level of atoms, at the level of molecules, at the level of enzymes, all of which are so important and we've talked about today, we've also got to teach them to see in a much bigger world. And um, I will uh, begin to close here with this beautiful analogy that Dr. Cassell wrote. Um, that um, it's common to confuse the question we're asking with the method that we use to get the answer, but the method determines the answer. Now listen to this. And I love this because he's using the rose, which is such an important uh, symbol all across the world for so many of our cultures. If we're asked to describe a rose and we're given only a ruler to do it, the picture of the rose that emerged would be solely in terms of inches. The picture would be true, but incomplete. 
If a ruler were our only way of describing things, we wouldn't even know that the picture was incomplete. So I think this is a beautiful analogy of how we do need science, we do need statistics, we do need these things, but it doesn't give us the complete picture. So medical humanities um, that we teach at Baylor and all over the world mainly involves these four areas, which I won't go into at length, um, but we have courses in all of these areas. And I believe that all of these things help inform our understanding of medicine. And I will end with this quote from, from Dr. Osler that from over-specialization that we all know we can be tempted to, scientific men are in a more perilous state than the humanists from neglect of classical tradition. We, we, cannot, we cannot neglect our classical tradition. We must think of building on this. And what he says is when all these studies, the humanities and the sciences reach the point of intercommunion and connection with one another and come to be considered in their mutual affinities, then I think, and not till then, will the pursuit of them have a value. So we must remember both parts of our training. And I thank you very much for your time and attention. And I'm especially moved by Dr. Hollick's comment at the very beginning of the conference that um, that this COVID, this experience has affected our health in general and our hearts in particular. And I'm very honored to be among um, physicians and colleagues who um, spend their lives in pursuit of heart matters. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Barron, for this is a great presentation. It gave us a different angle of, of, the, of practicing medicine, which is a very important one. And uh, thank you for this great presentation. We are so pleased to have you uh, with us thank tonight. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we'll continue on uh, with Dr. Fekri el um, And uh, he will be speaking about uh, pulmonary embolism in COVID-19. Uh, uh, Dr. el is there in the UAE. And uh, we welcome you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for uh... And your kind introduction, uh, just to make sure, uh, is my voice clear? Yes, perfect. Great. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Omar and Dr. Krishar uh, for uh, the nice invitation. I have been part of this meeting since the beginning, and I have the honor to uh, um, participate with, uh, with cases every year. It's very nice gathering. Uh, I have to say that I enjoyed the previous uh, uh, presentation, Dr. Perron, it was amazing. And thank you very much for reminding us to be human before being doctors. That's amazing message and enjoyed this presentation very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to share with you today uh, uh, an interesting case of uh, heart thrombosis in a patient with COVID-19, um, um, which I uh, had to uh, share his treat her treatment uh, last April. Uh, April was a very tough month for, for me because uh, uh, we are three interventional cardiologists and two of my colleagues uh, were hit by the virus. So I was alone for one month and I had to take care of the whole uh, cardiac uh, patients, the whole hospital uh, for almost three, we three weeks. This lady uh, was unfortunate. She was a 32 years old lactating woman uh, who was admitted on the 3rd of April. Uh, because of low back pain and intermittent vomiting for two, three, two to three days. She was admitted actually under general uh, medicine and uh, uh, she was investigated for her low back pain and for vomiting. And uh, she developed suddenly shortness of breath at rest uh, and with mild effort in her room. And that's when I was involved with the, in the case. Uh, on examining the patient, she was in good shape. Uh, if febrile, uh, heart rate was 68 per minute, blood pressure was fine. Uh, she is uh, BMI was 26, uh, respiratory rate was 20. So I just um, uh, did an ECG, an echo to uh, get uh, uh, some idea about her heart. And uh, uh, at the same time, a sample for coronavirus was taken. And at that stage, the internist did an MR spine who found suspected bone metastasis with unknown primary. And the MRI brain was within normal. And she had lumbar puncture, which she showed some improvement of her lower back pain after. 
So this is uh, the lab of this patient. She had quite high YSL count, the neutrophil were high, and the lymphocytes were low, and the hemoglobin was quite low, 8.5. The CRB was high, D dimers were high, and S ferritin was high. And that was the reason why uh, I requested the uh, coronavirus uh, test because uh, the, the lab is uh, suggesting uh, you know, the presence of corona. The ECG to start with was not uh, uh, showing any uh, significant changes as you could pass it as normal. However, when you read the echo, I think you can um, appreciate here this uh, clot in the right ventricle. So that was a, a striking finding, you know, we found this clot and you can also appreciate that there is some uh, pericardial effusion here with some indentation of the right atrium, some effusion also on the other side of the heart. We uh, recorded this and uh, I immediately shifted the patient uh, to the ICU uh, after I gave her 5,000 units of unfractionated heparin and she was started on enoxaparin uh, 60 milligram uh, sub-Q twice daily. And uh, we, uh, I ordered CTA pulmonary angio to rule out pulmonary embolism, which uh, was, uh, was, uh, was, would not be detected. And later on, the COVID-19 RNA-PCR came back positive, so the, the, the picture was clear that this patient has COVID-19 beside her metastasis. So at this stage, uh, we formed a multidisciplinary team of the oncologists, pulmonologists, uh, the intensive and, and myself, and we we're managing this patient on a daily basis. Eventually, an adenocarcinoma of the lung uh, was confirmed to be the primary source, and the patient, uh, you know, has COVID-19 with RV thrombosis and pneumonia. And she was treated by my colleagues with respective problems. The, uh, adenocarcinoma, the pulmonologist was taking care of the pneumonia and the intensivist you know, was doing his part. I, I did some serial echoes to just monitor the size and the fate of these thrombus to make sure that it is under control and it won't cause any uh, significant or major pulmonary embolism. She was continued on sub-Q anticoagulant all, all this time, and uh, my colleagues treated her with multiple IV injections. You can uh, imagine there are some antibiotic and some uh, dexamethasone, methylprednisone. And after one month uh, of uh, anticoagulation, almost uh, I had to repeat the, the uh, echo, and uh, uh, at this time, uh, the clot completely disappeared, you know, maybe some remnant here if you might, you know, suspect, but the, definitely the clot is not the same like how it was before. So I decided to uh, continue the, uh, the anticoagulant for some time. And my role here was limited, so I was just called on demand. The patient, unfortunately, uh, uh, worsened her condition from the pulmonary side and she had to be intubated and mechanically ventilated. And uh, she uh, underwent treatment for a long time. And then her family elected to evacuate her by air ambulance to a local hospital in her country. So I don't know what happened to her after that, unfortunately. So I come here to the discussion. Uh, uh, as discussed by many of my colleagues before, the proposed mechanism for COVID-19 induced thrombosis include a disease-specific hypercoagulable state, cytokine-mediated diffuse microvascular damage, and in some cases, reactive thrombocytosis. The risk of thrombosis and pulmonary embolism can further be compounded by some factors like obesity, advanced age, and hospitalization-related embolization, in my patient, the patient had elevated C-reactive protein, elevated D-dimer levels, with no other risk factors for pulmonary embolism. Therefore, COVID-19-related high agarbid status was uh, assumed to be the possible cause of thrombosis in the right ventricle in this patient. 
So to conclude, it is imperative to follow prophylactic measures for avoiding venous thromboembolism in COVID-19 patients, sudden deterioration in respiratory status that is not explained by significant radiological changes in the lung field, and especially in conjunction with high titers of D-dimer should raise suspicion for pulmonary embolism. More studies are needed to determine the utility of therapeutic doses of anticoagulant agent in high-risk patients with COVID-19 as a prophylaxis, you know, uh, before uh, it happens, as a matter of fact. Uh, you can imagine, and I think you were familiar with this, we had to, every time doing a procedure to be completely uh, covered like this to protect ourselves from uh, this uh, dangerous infection. And uh, we did our best to protect our patient. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I think we'll leave the questions till the end as uh, the time is uh, running fast. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Aldeeb. We, uh, we uh, appreciate that wonderful uh, talk and we will save questions for the end. Um, right now, um, we're going to bring Dr. Kowatli. Uh, Dr. Kowatli is consultant pulmonologist, critical care medicine, invasive pulmonologist at King's College Hospital, London, Dubai. Uh, and he'll be presenting uh, about, uh, a, I think in generalities, uh, about COVID complications. Go ahead, sir. Well, thank you very much. Okay, let me get it here. Okay. Okay. Well, um, before we start, thank you very much for inviting me and Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, well, as you know, that COVID, uh, um, the coronavirus was discovered years ago in, in the 50s. And this is Dr. June Alimedia who discovered the virus in somebody who has upper respiratory tract infection. And um, so she submitted at that time the picture of the coronavirus, but it gets refused by the peer review. But finally, she gets it uh, approved and gets um, uh, published by British Medical Journal. And we know that with this COVID-19, we are seeing too, too many different things. For the first time, I've seen that articles in good journal like Lancet and New England get removed because of uh, um, not well done uh, studies. And I put this here to, um, just uh, to remind all of us about the ACE2 receptors, which usually the virus uh, uh, from the spike S1 and S2 get bind to it. And this is uh, can happen in the respiratory mucosa and other part of the body. Why I put that here? Because it is so uh, important for us to remember that smokers usually will have increase of these receptors and that will put them at very high risk. Even I couldn't find it that this is uh, in all publication, uh, as a risk factor for a uh, bad outcome. Um, they will mention the COPD and chronic lung disease, but smoking per se by itself, it will increase the rate of infection and the rate of complication. And we know about the cases, actually it's getting higher uh, uh, worldwide, uh, people getting infected. But uh, the good news is that the mortality you can see in the cartoon on the right is decreasing. And we know that there is some people who are at high risk, uh, pe uh, people in prison, nursing home, uh, who work in me uh, meat pack, uh, packing plants because they breathe fast because of the cold weather, people are working in ships and the crews, and even in, uh, in the marines. Uh, and uh, we know now that there is a special attention to the children since we uh, decided to open the schools uh, and, um, at the uh, middle of uh, uh, this month. And there is an increased cases of already patients getting hospitalized uh, because of the uh, COVID-19. And you can see recently that the hospitalization has increased by 40%, and this is before opening the school, and that can cause uh, a lot of consequences, especially a lot of hospitals, they do not have pediatric ICU uh, and if needed. 
And uh, we know that this is very important. This is just published recently. Actually, this morning I was looking to the CDC after I prepared my talk. And uh, um, the, the COVID is not only affecting patients uh, who get sick, but people who are not sick. Like uh, in the military, people are counting the people who get dying uh, during the invasion of uh, Iraq. But there is uh, uh, the mental health status happen after that, where people could, all these vets committing suicide. And I used to see it when I was working at the VA. Um, a lot of people having with post-traumatic stress syndrome because I'm sleep specialist and they cannot sleep. And the same thing's happening now because people are losing their job and their income. And you can see in the United States. It's uh, anxiety and depression symptoms increasing by 31%, increased substance use by 13%, uh, uh, like post-traumatic stress syndrome, 26%, and 11% uh, are considering um, suicide, which it is significant. Now, we know about this in the past, that people in India getting less disease and less mortality because they received uh, BCG. And I thought when they were talking in India at that time that this is because of genetic factor, but even can occur in Caucasian. And you can see uh, in, uh, um, uh, in slide C that even in the Caucasian, and when they uh, received the PCG uh, uh, vaccine, comparing with people who did not receive, the mortality and the infection is much less in this patient. And we know also that there is some discrimination happening in the treatment of patients. This is all from the United States of America, that uh, um, the minorities are getting less attention comparing with the others, and that has caused them to have more disease. Um, um, I am very uh, pleased here that in this country, we treated all the same, even we have 80 nationalities, and we have a lot of uh, uh, people who are not rich. Uh, we all treated them the same. And you can see here that uh, uh, the black and Hispanic having more disease and more uh, hospitalize, uh, has hospitalization and more to die uh, because of the COVID comparing with other, others. And that's in multiple states in the United States of America. Now, people will tell me that's because they do have comorbidity. That is true, but also because of financial issue. We know that uh, African-American has more obesity, has more diabetes, more uh, chronic renal disease, uh, and more sickle cell disease and hypertension. All these are risk factor and uh, put them at high risk, but uh, you can see that the social economic status is uh, a problem. Also the access to care and uh, unemployment and also uh, socially when they cannot have social distancing uh, and that will put them um, uh, in high risk. And uh, uh, what like in all this slide that if the most important factor with all this is educating uh, 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 the population. And that is, I believe, the best weapon we have uh, to uh, stop this type of discrimination at the COVID uh, at, uh, time. And uh, if you uh, lift the, uh, the MERS and SARS as I did, uh, as, uh, uh, we lift SARS in America, uh, uh, we did not have mortality 9% at that time. And most of the cases were actually on Toronto. MERS here, uh, it was more scary than the COVID, the mortality 34%. I have one of my respiratory therapists at that time gets uh, the disease by taking care of patient and he died uh, because we could not uh, save his life with the severe neutropenia, white cells count of zero. And uh, uh, you can see the SARS is much, much less mortality. And I believe that's reflected why we did not deal uh, with this disease from the beginning as uh, a pandemic, because when we look, uh, as all the politicians looked at the uh, mortality and found it very less comparing with the other disease. And you have seen this slide uh, before. But this is very important to me because that's, we'll, uh, we'll talk uh, about a lot of things we have, have and we have not done to our patients with COVID. If you will see in stage uh, one, when the patients start to have the symptoms, I believe this is the window where you can use the uh, uh, antiviral. Um, and uh, 
the antiviral, while at the big, at the ends where there is the cytokine storm, the host inflammatory response, when um, we we give this antiviral, it may not work, and that was the, the problem. We at the beginning we stopped giving patients antiviral until they are very sick, and uh, that's why it did not work. And uh, I'm, for the time, I will go through this fast. We know, you all of, know, uh, of you know about the symptoms, mild symptoms and severe symptoms of COVID. But what it is alarming here, this is some, I am not cardiologist, but these are some cases we started to see in children, Kowalski-like syndrome. And uh, uh, first gets published uh, uh, by a British group, and they saw that this is will uh, uh, cause mortality, high mortality in children. It, it causes skin rash and multiple organ damage, including respiratory and cardiac. And you can see on the uh, echo here that these children will have dilatation in the coronary uh, artery. You don't see it usually, uh, coronary artery uh, uh, on the echo, but it is dilated because of aneurysm. Um, yes, and it one minute. One minute. Oh, okay. And this is the same, we saw it in America. There was about 186 cases and you can see it's affecting boys more than girls and it's affecting uh, the minority uh, uh, more. And uh, I, I heard a lot of things about hypercoagulation. Um, it's just because of increased uh, hypervascularity. These patients have thrombosis. They can have PE. My problem as a pulmonologist, that uh, we don't know uh, how many people is going to have a chronic thrombomyopathy disease later on. Uh, and that's why if uh, any of these patients has any exertion shortness of breath, we need to look uh, at that later on, because uh, they may develop that, and, but we don't know uh, what is the ratio. Uh, and uh, we know this study came also recently, uh, just last week, uh, done in New York, about 14% of the health worker, when they screened about 40,000, has uh, uh, antibodies, uh, even uh, uh, they have not been diagnosed, uh, quite a few of them with the disease, and that uh, means that they uh, carry the antibodies. And this is very important now when we are talking about the vaccination, and we still know if this antibody will protect. And this hydroxychloroquine, the FDA removed it after two studies did not show one in the Lancet and one, uh, one in the British Medical Journal and one in the New England. And this is another study just published recently about hydroxychloroquine to protect them from having uh, the uh, the COVID they failed. I have a patient, I was going to report the case from the beginning, was taking 400 milligram BID for his lupus, and he came with very bad case of uh, sorry, of COVID-19 because it did not help him in preventing disease. And this is done uh, on uh, a large number of patients, and you can see the result. I will stop here if you want me. Uh, I can just give you here, here about the decadron. This is a rec recovery study uh, published in uh, uh, in the New England, done in multiple centers in UK, which shows that's giving decadron to patients who have severe hypoxia, not for everybody, because it may be harmful if you did uh, to the patient not having severe hypoxia. Severe hypoxia, uh, they may improve survival, and you can save one life uh, by treating uh, eight patients while they are on ventilator and severe hypoxia. And I believe this is the most important study we have right now. And thank you very much uh, for having me. I have more, but we'll stop here. Dr. Kowatli, you are amazing. All these speakers, I wish that we had more time for you all. And we will in another a next generation of RTS. Oh. We Coming soon, so, we will have uh, a lot. Well, I, I like to thank Dr. Baron for her speak today because I believe we need to be a human when we are practicing medicine rather than just uh, having the medical information. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Khalid Malik, a regional medical lead and CMO um, with Upchan. And we want to thank Upchan and Pfizer, uh, as well as King's College Hospital, uh, London, Dubai, for their support of this great endeavor uh, today. Dr. Khalid, take it away. So, um, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I love the presentations before. We had uh, so many eminent speakers. I would like to just thank, thank the organizers for giving uh, Pfizer Upjohn the opportunity to support and sponsor this uh, uh, project. 
Um, I feel that you know being part of this very imminent conference is really, really uh, an honor for us. Um, can any can everybody can you hear me properly? Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about um, a little bit um, out of the way. I'm not just going to talk to you about um, uh, cardiac health, but uh, I want to talk to you about the NCDs, uh, which are the non-communicable diseases, right? Um, the non-communicable diseases are uh, key um, chronic diseases which uh, the WHO have, are looking at in order to um, increase the mortality and morbidity. Um, Upjohn is a part of uh, Pfizer, it's a division of Pfizer, uh, and it's that division of Pfizer that concentrates on non-communicable diseases. Um, our purpose is to, break, uh, to create breakthroughs that change patients' lives. Our mission is to relieve the burden of NCDs with trusted quality solutions. And we emphasize on solutions. It's not just the pill. We're looking at solutions for every patient everywhere. And our ambition is to reach 225 million new patients by the year 2025. If you look at the NCDs, WHO, uh, you know, chronic illnesses, most of them come under the NCDs, but the key five NCDs are uh, cardiovascular disease, chronic respiratory disease, cancer, diabetes, mental health, and neurological conditions. So today we are talking about cardiovascular. It is one of the key NCDs, uh, and uh, there's so many risk factors associated with this. And the WHO have uh, coined this term as five, five by five. Uh, so main risk factors, unhealthy diet, tobacco use, harmful use of alcohol, physical inactivity, and air pollution. So these are the key NCDs, and today we're talking about cardiovascular in this particular forum. Uh, but I think it's important for uh, the um, audience to, to realize that, you know, there's a disproportionate NCD burden in the emerging markets, and we belong to the emerging markets right now. And if you see that, you know, there's 71% um, uh, of all, you know, global um, deaths are happening uh, within... Uh, the emerging markets, uh, that's about 41 million uh, global deaths, right? Um, and 85% of these, sorry, uh, 41 million global deaths, 85% of these are happening in the emerging markets, right? And uh, one third of these are premature deaths. So these are those deaths that we can actually do something about. We can prevent them. And uh, we, because we're not acting properly, we're spending roughly $7 trillion in tr trying to treat these. If we act, um, you know, uh, proactively, we will be able to say to to spend only 170 billion. So it's a big cost issue over here as well. Um, these uh, the main um, focus today uh, is on mental health for me, right? Because I know there'll be so many of us talking about cardiovascular health today, but we have to consider mental health because during the pandemic era, uh, there are major implications for cardiovascular health and other patients. Um, uh, cardiovascular disease and other patients, uh, because mental health is um, really being impacted in this pandemic era. Uh, there are direct health complications, and also there is a disruption, a disruption of delivery of standard of care right now, um, because what we see is people are not getting to hospitals. If they're going to hospitals, COVID is getting, you know, uh, the the preference at the moment. So many people are are being um, left without proper uh, treatment proper follow-up in this era and that's also leading uh, to a lot of mental anguish. Um, what we see that pandemics increase uh, the poor mental well-being and there are several factors that you know contribute to that. Um, vulnerability and predisp predisposition of mental health that's one of them. Then you know people are working from home now I mean all of us you know like for example ourselves myself as well we've been working from home for the last five months there's no interaction, human to human interaction as such. That's also adds to the stress. And then because of COVID, you've, we've seen that there's been a big impact on unemployment that leads to poverty. Poverty again leads to mental health issues. Um, they cannot buy food, they cannot buy you know, proper diet. They have a poor diet now, especially in the underdeveloped countries. Uh, most of the countries which I'm looking after as a lead of Africa, Middle East, I mean, I'm seeing this happening on a regular basis. Um, there's also uh, issues that we're seeing with domestic violence, which is leading to mental health problems as well. I mean, the previous speaker spoke about, you know, the impact on, on mental health 
and the suicide rates are increasing also. Um, social isolation, reduced access to healthcare. So all of these factors contribute towards uh, a, a key issue, which is mental health issues. We need to, and as cardiovascular you know, physicians, we also need to consider the impact that this COVID is having, not only in cardiac health, but also on the mental health. Um, the, the, these, if you look at these challenges, they come among, the, they, they're, um, there's a fear amongst the community. So whenever there's an infectious disease, the communities always start getting scared and that leads more to mental anguish. Economical aspects, I just spoke about, environmental aspects, you know, uh, with regards to the lockdowns, et cetera, um, the outcomes of certain diseases because of non-access to medical health is also a big issue. All of these are leading to mental health, you know, um, uh, increasing mental health uh, issues across the world. Um, social distancing, again, isolation, loneliness, all of these key factors that we need to consider. Uh, and then, you know, people are fear, uh, are fearsome of this illness and the recovery from this illness. So all of this has got a negative impact on our mental health. Um, I, for one, uh, I'm a very big proponent that whenever we see a patient, we should also uh, try to analyze the mental health and mental well-being of the patient. And if we can do that properly, we should be able to, you know, then channel them to the right, to the right person because a person can have a fantastic heart, right? But if they're not well up here in the mind, then they're not going to be well at all. So we need to, we need to look at that as well. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but, you know, interventions in mental health can start from the very beginning. You know, we need to keep mental health in, in our minds. So we need to start well, we need to develop well, we need to live well, we need to work well, and at the end, we need to age well as well, right? So um, these factors, you know, will help us, you know, uh, better our, our mental health. Um, one of my great friends and... Uh, okay, one of my great, uh, okay, thank you. One of my great friends and who is uh, the head of the world, Psych uh, the president-elect of the World Psychiatry Association, Professor Abdal Javed said that there is no health without mental health. So we need to concentrate on mental health. Like all of you guys, you're concentrating on treating patients. Uh, up John, we're concentrating on the NCD uh, treatment. Also, we're doing beyond the pill, you know, solutions. And one of the solutions is health matters with Dr. Adam. Uh, I explained this last time when I saw you guys, we have a fantastic, you know, a digital platform which contains infotainment videos. If anybody has had the privilege to travel Emirates Airlines, you will see that this is now visible on the Emirates Airlines. You can see down here, the ICE magazine, we, we launched it over here. We have multiple episodes on this and we have more than you know 300,000 views right now. Um, we have now created a um, health matter with Dr. Adam video on the COVID infection. Uh, and, uh, we, and anybody who wants to use it can reach out to us uh, and we can help them, you know, uh, have access to this. If you want to see these videos more, you can go to the Get Healthy, Stay Healthy website, and this will give, give you, you know, a, a preview of the videos that, that can be seen. These videos can be used anywhere else if you want to. If you want to contact me, this is my number, khalid.malik at pfizer.com, and I want to thank all of you uh, for this amazing conference, and thanks, Annie, for your timekeeping. It's amazing. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much for keeping on, on time. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Yes, we've uh, watched that Health Matters on the Emirates Airlines, and it's a really tremendous education for people. Now, we want to bring uh, our next speaker, Dr. Al Zubadi, um, who hails from Abu Dhabi there uh, as consultant interventional cardiologist, going to speak about ST elevation myocardial infarction in COVID-19. Dr. Al Zubadi is a current president of uh, Emirate Cardiac Society. Wonderful. He's, a, he's, a, he's an excellent indicator and excellent cardiologist. Thank you. Welcome. Sorry. I'm just trying to get my, my camera set. So uh, thanks, Dr. Arman. Thanks uh, to the organizer for the, uh, for the invitation to uh, this very informative uh, meeting. Uh, yeah, can you hear me, please? Yes, absolutely. Yes. So, uh, you know, I, I got a very brief uh, uh, talk here, and uh, I'm just going to share with you a case, uh, a case of mine that we had, uh, you know, during, uh, especially during the epidemic. So, uh, you know, we are uh, relatively a busy uh, center. We do about 30 STEMIs uh, a month uh, between two sites. And uh, 
one of the things we noticed is a decline in the number of cases, especially in the peak months, April and, and May. I'm going to show you those numbers. Uh, and also the mix of the patients, especially the STEMI and the COVID positive patients, um, you know, the pattern of the disease and the presentation of those patients were a bit uh, different than what we are used to. So I'm going to share with you a case and then just, uh, uh, you know, share with you some a few slides um, that uh, looked at one of the uh, centers uh, that looked at their COVID uh, experience. Uh, and this was published recently in the JAC. So uh, this is a 46 year old uh, uh, gentleman who's relatively healthy. And he present to one of the community hospitals with epigastric pain and his ECG uh, clearly shows a massive anterior uh, lateral ST elevation uh, myocardial infarction. And um, so, you know, this case uh, went or was taken um, directly to the cath lab. Of course, we noticed delays in, in, in you know, in getting and preparing the cath lab team, getting the patient to the lab because of all the different protocols uh, of, of um, uh, you know, of uh, safety or to take safety of the staff. The chest X-ray of this patient shows, you know, a prominent interstitial markings, and sometimes just difficult to differentiate between, you know, is this a, a, a pneumonia or is this a pulmonary edema uh, among our acute MI uh, patients. Um, so as you would expect, this patient should have an LED um, a target. And you can see the right coronary artery is a large vessel dominant but, and free of, uh, of disease. Uh, the uh, LED, interestingly, uh, got a two uh, culprit uh, legions, as you would see here, one in the LED, and then the second one is in the uh, is involving the uh, the diagonal. So uh, uh, both uh, both vessels were wired, and uh, multiple attempts with the balloon angioplasty was not successful to restore the flow. Uh, aspiration thrombectomy was. Uh, was used and despite all of those uh, uh, interventions uh, and, uh, and maneuvers, it was not easy to get the, uh, to restore the flow and to the LED. So there is a heavy uh, thrombus burden and that is probably uh, uh, embolizing and uh, distally and uh, affecting the micro uh, vasculature of this uh, of these patients. So a lot of attempts, but no, no luck to get it back. So the patient was uh, taken to the, uh, to the CCU. He was given a tyrofiban and heparin infusion, and then a repeat angiography and attempt again, a PCI to the LED, which you, someone may question the value of that. But uh, this was also done again in, in, in a couple of days or the next day, I think. And, 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 uh, and this was not, uh, was also not successful. So this patient ended having a, a severe LDV dysfunction because of this massive uh, a thrombi uh, affecting, you know, uh, uh, multiple coronaries. So, uh, uh, so just to share with you, I mean, the couple of points here, this is the cases that we had uh, over the months. And so on average, we get about 30 cases Interesting in April and May, there was a, you know, a good drop in the cases and we don't know the reason, probably patients, uh, it's a mixed, uh, I would say factors. One of them is the patients are afraid to come to the hospital. So some of them just uh, had a, uh, you know, um, had myocardial infarctions at home and, and probably we're gonna see their, uh, you know, the complications of those patients who survived those MIs. Uh, and what we got is probably the worst of the worst of, uh, of the STEMIs. The other thing is the number of STEMIs uh, with a COVID positive is not as high as, um, as seen in, uh, in some other uh, reported uh, uh, series. Uh, but we did have a good number, especially of COVID positive patients in May and also in, uh, in June. Uh, this is a single center experience that was uh, 
published recently a couple of weeks back in, in Jack. And as you would see, the baseline characteristics of those patients, you know, are, um, you know, uh, just shows you the, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the number of patients who had a very high troponins was, uh, sorry, the COVID patients uh, had a more troponin rise, uh, of course, more inflammation and, uh, you know, D-dimer on all the signs of hyper uh, Coagulability is um, is is there. Uh, the um, another factors, of course, is the uh, you know the or findings is you know multivessel thrombosis. They noticed that in seven of the patients, like our case, uh, stent thrombosis was higher uh, in these patients. And uh, another interesting finding is the is the flow or the you know the. Um, uh, uh, the 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 you know the thrombus grade and the modifies modified uh, thrombus uh, grade post first device the TME flow so all of those factors are indicative of of a high uh, uh, thrombus burden in the COVID uh, patients and that makes it a challenge as to how to manage uh, the anticoagulation and antiplatelets uh, in these patients the procedural outcome as you can see here. Uh, you know, the mortality, uh, the intensive care admissions, and the length of stay are, uh, you know, are uh, worse in, in, the, uh, in the COVID uh, patients. Uh, so, uh, so that's a, you know, that, that gives us a feel that these patients are, uh, are a different cohort compared to the usual STEMI patients that we see. So the more complex clinical presentation and geographic findings are more complex, of course, a high thrombus burden and probably a worse, um, a worse uh, clinical, uh, clinical outcomes. So that's a uh, simple straight and, uh, and of Thank course, so much, uh, unanswered, was, uh, a lot of unanswered questions, Dr. Omar, yeah. for us to, in terms of managing these patients that were still, uh, you know, we still need to learn. We're still learning what to do, what will be the best way to do it. It is very kind of difficult, challenging. I mean, you, you try to aspiration, did that work? Yes. So it's, it's really a tough one. And uh, you did really kind of a lot of uh, very uh, aggressive uh, management. But uh, as, as you said, uh, we still let, need to learn what is the best way to do to deal with those patients. Is it thrombolytic therapy maybe a, an, an, a better option at this time for COVID? Uh, I guess something needs to be answered. Thank you so much for uh, your presentation. Thanks. Thank you for Thank you, Dr. Zavadi. We were, we're going to move onward uh, to Dr. Kenneth Liao, uh, who hails from Baylor College of Medicine, professor and chief division of cardiac thoracic surgery. Yes, we'll be talking about um, new technologies in cardiac thoracic surgery. Dr. Liao. Okay, great. Thank you. Can you hear me? Let me try to bring up the screen. Can you see my uh, screen? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. So thank you for uh, for the invitation. Uh, thanks, doc, <clears throat> Dr. Omar Halak and uh, Dr. Crazy for and the organizing committee for the invitation. And my talk is um, about technology, surgery, whether it can help, particularly in this COVID uh, pandemic season in treating um, the patient. As you can see that, uh, hold on a second, sorry. Um, Make it um, good. Is it okay? Better now? Okay, good. Yeah. As you can see, the uh, in right now in Houston, in Texas, where the pandemic center, epic center of uh, COVID infection, and um, as you can see, we're the third largest state in the U.S. and have the COVID disease. Over half a million uh, people get infected, and um, so as you can see in our hospital. The ICU is full in the last uh, few weeks. And then uh, in this kind of, um, it certainly has a lot of burden on the uh, hospital as well as the stress on the physicians, healthcare providers, as well as patients. So the people <clears throat> would ask, is it safe to perform open heart surgery now? So the answer is yes, but you have to go through this complex algorithms to make sure that 
this is done properly. So these two algorithms you can see on the left side is for the outpatient algorithm, how to safely conduct the surgery. And then on the right side is the inpatient setting, how to conduct COVID surgery in the COVID situation. But as you can see, like any algorithm, if you see very complicated with all these lines and charts, then that tells we do not know. We don't have good solution. That's why it looks very complex. But the ultimate is to simplify it, is that if someone patient has COVID infection is symptomatic, we should delay the surgery as much as possible. If someone recently had the infection, we should wait for 20 days, perhaps if not, wait for 10 days at minimum before we do the surgery. And as for surgeons, we should wear the appropriate PPE. The patient is has active COVID infection, we could wear airborne protection gears to do the surgery. So now that you can see that it is easier to wear the, uh, the, the protective wear to perform the basic procedure such as intubation or do some suction and sputum, but to wear the airborne gears to perform open heart surgery, cardiac surgery probably is very difficult. Number one, you cannot see that well. Number two, it is uh, very uncomfortable. You cannot wear it for too long and without um, and hurting yourself. So the other, the other question we have now, the earlier part of the algorithm address to how to protect healthcare providers, surgeons to have how to perform the surgery without getting infected. But we have never really answered the questions to the patient. Is it safe to have open heart surgeries now in the hospital? In As Dr. Kowati earlier presented that about 13% of the healthcare providers are infected. And they are most of them asymptomatic as a recent New York uh, uh, survey suggests or antibodies suggest. So in the case like this, and are they safe to be operated upon by the healthcare providers about 13% of them are infected or has a positive antibody has positive virus. And then we know CDC has suggested the way that to control the infection is through social distancing, that's the six feet distance, wearing the mask, that also can bring it down to 50% of reduction, it's never 100%. So now let's look at particularly the masks Different mask has different ways, but that none of this mask, even we call it surgical mask, surgical um, mask in the cool one that would not really prevent, completely prevent uh, the virus leaking out from the mask. As you can see from this particular picture, from the, even for the airborne, uh, for the uh, N95 mask, even though you can protect healthcare providers very well, protecting the person who wears, but unfortunately it doesn't perfect, prevent the virus leaking from the, the person who is wearing the mask to the environment. So as you can see, if you wear the surgical mask, about 50% of the particles can leak in out easily. If you wear N95, about 30% of virus can still leak in out to the environment. So now, just imagine that they, we have not even considered the orifice, the recipient orifice area. If the recipient is has a wide open orifice to be exposed to the virus environment, then that what's the situation? What's the risk of infection there? As you can see, imagine in open heart surgery, the patient's chest is wide open, and the surgeon wear the mask, and then we're stand, staring at this big heart, the heart, and do the surgery standing for hours. And then to do that, then what's the potential risk of the provider's assistance and the leaking through the mask to those patient's chest and to the heart and then suck out in the bloodstream is the direct uh, virus drop into the blood system. Just imagine. So no, we do not know. So that's what it's, it's right for, so for people are concerned about to ask a question, it is safe to have open heart surgery. So next, we always in the past, you know, now we need to find a solution. We need to find the answers that cardiac surgeon is. And um, we always need to, to think about, is there a way to improve patient safety without compromising the strength, surgeon's ability to perform the surgery? So now we, so yes, there probably there's a way. The way is now like any, any time we have difficulties, 
the pioneer cardiac surgeon Dr. Lillehei has told us what mankind can dream the research and technology can, can achieve. In the earlier years when he was cardiac surgeon and he was told the open heart surgery is a forbidden area, nobody should touch the heart. But with, however, he used the biological parents to be used the heart lung machine, biological heart lung machine to successfully perform a series of congenital heart <clears throat> defect repairs. Because of his pioneering surgery and then the whole field of open heart surgery opens up. The same is for the space uh, technology, as you can see, the recent the SpaceX launch of space shuttle from the first generation of Ball Apollo, the most recent Dragon one. This is uh, exactly the advancement of the technology can make a huge difference. It's much safer, easier, and everything looks good at the end. So now, what's the new technology? Similar technologies like SpaceX and cardiac surgery. It is a robot. It is a robotic that we have the venture robotic system. The concept is the surgeon is operating on the computer console to control the operating controller. The assistant insert the tools into the patient's body and then the, the surgeon would operate upon the patient. As you can see this specific <laughs> setting, I want to show you, this is the daily routine in the, our center, Baylor's and Luke's Medical Center, we use robotic surgery every day and then to perform this cardiac surgery. As you can see that the surgeon is away from the, the, the patient. And then there's a distance, this, the assistant is also has to keep a distance from the patient. And then the orifice of the patient's opening spot is very small. The chance of getting exposed is small. Plus, as you can see, the tube we inserted into the space is CO2 tube. We insufflate the CO2 carbon dioxide into the upper field. There's constantly CO2 coming out up from the cavity towards the surface. So there's no bacteria can or virus can drop in. It's always coming outside. But this way, through a, yeah, through a small surface and then through the CO2 prevention, and then this actually can, to a certain degree, protect patient from getting the virus exposure and then in the the the, um, the infection. So how this was done, the technology. So as you can see, this is the mitral valve repair. We typically was this is a prolapsed mitral valve. As you can see here, we grab it, identify it, and then we'll use a pair of scissors to. Oh no, let me see. A pair of scissors to cut. Yeah, a pair of scissors to cut out this uh, ruptured and the core, the ruptured. Uh, uh, piece of the uh, the valve, and then after that, we stitch it the valve, the normal valves around it together with the Gore-Tex sutures. It's all done through the robotic assist control and the instruments, mm -hmm. and then after that, we completed the stitching first to bring this normal structure together, the valve. And then we place an uh, annular plastic ring on the, on the, on the, uh, we inserted annulus suture to anchor the ring on the mitral annulus. Actually this, the image visualization is through 3D and the surgeon saw a 3D picture and it's 10 times magnification. It's very clear, very precise. I would say the movement is very gentle on this, on the, uh, oh, so, hold on one second. Let's, uh, hold on one second. Okay. So then we put the, 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 the band in um, onto the valve Endless, and then we tie the knots. Everything is automatic, as you can see, we, we don't use the hand tie anymore. Mm -hmm. Now we test the valve after repair. The valve looks great. So I would, I would stop here and I just want to show you, demonstrate to you, this is a new generation of technology you can achieve, do the, do the fine surgery, and then um, uh, by the same time you can protect the patient in a way that uh, the, 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 you never thought about before. 
and uh, I want to thank you, thank you for your attention, and thanks the opportunity to to give the presentation. <laughs> Dr. Liao, that was amazing, and we always always are in awe of our cardiovascular surgeon colleagues. Um, what great things you can do. We thank you so much for that. We're sorry we're so limited in time. Yeah, our next you. speaker uh, will be Dr. Abdul Baro uh, from Mississippi, hailing from the South, uh, just like me. I grew up in Georgia. So Dr. Baro, take it away. You're going to talk about critical limb ischemia. <laughs> All right, we will need Dr. Liao's slides down and Dr. Barrow's slides up, please. Good night. All right, that's good. Y'all are doing so good. I told Dr. Halleck in the in between all these, I said, we need four hours of conference, not two, because we have too many great speakers. You absolutely need some little bit of a uh, break in between to absorb the, the delay, because we have so many great talks and we kind of uh, feel bad to, to cut it short. Yeah, hopefully <laughs> sure. next time we'll do a better job. Yeah. Of course. Dr. Barrow, very good. Trying to get my presentation. One second, please. Dr. Barrow? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, trying to get my presentation. One second. Um, hold on right. um, check my share screen. Yeah, it's sharing. Just oh. everything was working fine except when I start my presentation. <laughs> It's probably uh, because I told you to yeah. speak No problem. If you want some time, we can uh, start with Dr. Samer if you want to. Do you want some time or you'll be okay? Would you like just to go to the next one and then give you some time? I think it's a good idea. Okay. All right. Go for Dr. Samer. Dr. Samer, are you there? Dr. Samer, I am there. Hand. Ready right. and happy. Well, Sorry we, welcome for the delay. You, we welcome you to our stage. Um, this has been truly a world stage and you're going to be talking about telemedicine. The future yes. is now. So do you see me? Do you hear me? Can you see the slide? Okay, we're waiting on your slides. You, can you see the slide? No, no slide. Don't see it. Can... Yes or no? No. No. Very good. Now you see it. Yeah. It's By the way, Dr. Samuel, one of the... Um, very highly edu uh, educating uh, doctors here in Emirates and worldwide. He has so many articles, almost a uh, monthly basis. He have uh, published an article in, in one of the major journal in, uh, in USA worldwide. He is uh, one he says of it's the- It's sharing, uh, thank you. Uh, Can you see now? In the quality. Yes. Can you see it? Yes? Yes. Okay, so yes. my presentation is less than 10 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Amar, my friend and colleague, all the speakers. Thank you, Baylor. Thank you, surgeons. Very brief. So as you know, one of the major change management that happened with uh, COVID-19 is this concept of telemedicine, telehealth, and medicine, artificial intelligence. Moved speed of light. Major change. People adopted it. The Congress, uh, Medicare, Medicaid in the States, and here, etc. So I'll just give you a flavor and give you some ideas about this. So with that in mind, you know, all of us know that uh, you know, we had to go through this. So in Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, where I'm currently working, we have barely had any cases where we saw patients virtually. This was almost 80, 90% for almost four months. And now it's going down. And that's something to be discussed in another meeting. Uh, I'm on the editorial board of telemedicine uh, and uh, blockchain journal. Again, we've seen articles that were submitted showing 80, 90% increase in the States and Europe and our areas, but it's really dipping down. Telemedicine is a big deal. What's the difference between telemedicine and telehealth? So telemedicine is used of technologies to remotely diagnose, monitor, and really manage patients. Telehealth is like the, the, the forest and telemedicine is the tree. Telehealth includes mHealth, artificial intelligence, what my dear colleagues from cardiac surgery discussed today, which is robotic uh, medicine. So there were before COVID-19, so many things going on, at least in the States and Europe, consumer demand, cost saving, value-based care, et cetera, pushing a little bit the pendulum towards the uh, telemedicine, but really very, very slowly. When uh, the COVID-19 came up, and we're talking perhaps you know, early March especially, things started moving remarkably faster. And... Um, this virus has truly transformed healthcare, but also showed areas of improvement and opportunities of improvement. 
The issue of face mask and PEPE, which my dear colleague from cardiac surgery discussed and other colleagues, is a big deal. This is a paper I've written on domino effect of medical error. And it talks about if you have a first victim, then second victim, at the end of the day, the whole community is being affected. And that holds so true when it comes to COVID-19. With that pandemic, this whole thing tested our healthcare system and virtual telehealth became a reality. And we all know about this. Social distancing, that simple concept that people can barely accept it, <laughs> even in our countries and the states, is becoming truly one of the key ways to address this, and hence moving telemedicine there. So I'm giving here an example of a patient that could or could not have COVID-19, but is sick, and basically we're always open, right? You can have this even 24 hours a day. You can even do one in Australia and one in our areas, and we can do it with you, and we can have a 24-hour system. And this will prevent emergency rooms from being overcrowded, limit exposure, and that's the most important. And quite honestly, patients and the caregivers are quite annoyed with the face mask. Uh, I was seeing patients and busy on Thursday, I came to CCAD at around 6.30 and I left at 6.30 with the face mask, which is not easy. This is a quick article from Gulf News, COVID-19 pandemic increases UAE acceptance of telemedicine, nothing unusual. Very quickly, and to be on time, patients want safety, healing, be kind to me, but they want to be engaged. And this technology truly engages patients if done properly. What, what is telemedicine? I think increasing patient engagement is a key thing that we saw in the COVID-19 era. And I hope to you have the same feeling. The numbers started increasing. This is up to 2012, barely an increase in the States. You should see the statistics from March till now. Uh, telemedicine also can widen the scope of medical practice. One simple example, not to take too much time, the kind of follow-up we can have with the patient, not by calling by phone, but something a lot more, and especially in cardiology with the M Health and the watch and the phone, etc. I mean, time does not permit me to discuss this. Dr. Fakhri and uh, Dr. Omar, remember, we were talking about a basic, usual clinical cardiology topic of systemic hypertension. I was asked to talk about it, and we've shown ample data from European Society of Cardiology and Jack that this probably is there, but we need a little bit more research on this. In summary, to be uh, you know on time, quite a few benefits. Limitation is really the physical exam, and obviously the whole idea of video component. Uh, like I had a patient in an area called Silla on uh, Wednesday. I simply could not connect with the patient because the internet was poor. This is around four hours from our center. Remember, if you add to it innovation and talk about M Health and talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, you're talking about literally moving towards the patient, owning their own health, having their record, sending us message and transforming healthcare completely with COVID and without COVID. And I'm not gonna take too much time on this. Summary, quality-wise challenges, uh, providers' credentials, we don't have currently appropriate credentialing, including Texas, including Washington and Cleveland, where I came from. Continuity of care is an issue because many times patients are seen by one person, another person, and obviously the efficacy. The appropriate use in clinical triage is adequate, uh, uh, adequacy of virtual exam. I mean, I still like to use my stethoscope, but now there are many ways to do this and the patient selection. Just quickly, this is a model from a society dear to our surgeons and to all of us, where they have a model, which I will not discuss, to really do this for the outpatient. And it's been tested, I mean, obviously for a few months, not more. The train has left the station. So Dr. Annie, are you gonna be with us in the train or not? And all of us. So, and we are, according to Time Magazine, we are the, uh, the person of the year. So uh, what I did over the past two years is I got excited about this topic before COVID-19, as uh, Dr. Omar said, we looked at telemedicine. We currently publish a key journal, uh, uh, you know, article on blockchain in COVID-19 with our colleagues from Khalifa University, other things. We also looked at application of artificial medicine, et cetera. But really telemedicine is not the future, it is the present. And it is really upon us as clinicians, my dear cardiac surgeon, my vascular, uh, my dear colleague from Pumbri and my friend and all of us, we really need to sit down and do three things and I'll stop here and hopefully Dr. Annie is still smiling. Number one, and most importantly, we need to regulate this and add a flavor of ethics 
Number two, we need to work with our insurance company and make sure that this is appropriately covered. But the most important thing is the third one, appropriate use, efficiency of use and efficacy so that this truly adds value and we have what we call value in healthcare. Thank you so much. Dr. Samer, thank you very much. That was excellent presentation. Uh, even um, when Dr. Barron was speaking, she mentioned that we had done seminar with even the ba Baylor students, the pre-medical students, teaching them that telemedicine is uh, uh, up and coming and it's here. Uh, so we have to all learn about it and, and use it. Thank you so much. Our last speaker. Yes, I think that Dr. was a great seminar. Thank you. Dr. Barron, are you uh, ready with your slides? We want to give you that opportunity to speak. This will be yep. the last talk. So we click share screen, right? Click share screen, that's correct. We'll see if it works this time. All right. Otherwise, you're going to speak from your heart. That's what I told you. <laughs> Here we go. Can you see the presentation now? Yes, very good. Go ahead. Um, yeah, it's um, unfortunately my presentation is nothing to do with COVID-19 because what I do mostly peripheral vascular disease, we've seen many patients with necrotic fingers and toes with COVID-19, but unfortunately nothing you could do with uh, percutane mostly. So this is mostly medical treatment. So I thought change the subject a little bit and show you some good cases because most of what I heard about COVID-19 is like kind of unfortunately depressing cases. The result most of the time is not the best. Um, you know, we have diabetes, diabetic patient, it's spreading very fast, as well as renal disease with dialysis. Patient uh, getting more and more around the world from the bad habit we eat, from non, uh, no exercise program, all of that. Um, and we've seen a lot of cases uh, with the arm necrosis and fingers like getting almost dead. I thought I'm going to share some cases with you. Those cases could be held definitely, but unfortunately, the treatment for those cases has been very, very limited. Surgically, barely you can do anything. So most of what you can do is percutaneously. This is a typical um, normal perfusion to the arm. You see the hand, it gets through the radial and ulnar arteries with the palmar arm supplying the digital vessels. Now, this is one of the cases, uh, cases I'm gonna show you some. This gentleman presented with, necro with necrotic changes to the tip of his, his fingers, very painful. Um, he went, so a surgeon for two weeks, put him on heparin, nothing helped. So he came to us. And as you see on the angiogram, he has short segment of occluded radial artery, which is the only vessel to the hand. So we took him to cath lab, cross the lesion, atherectomy with atherectomy device, followed by balloon angioplasty. And um, this is when we finished from him. And geographically, the vessel is wide open. He got significant supply to the hand. And can you hear me? And this is yes. when you came with for follow-up four to six weeks later, completely healed. A second patient, you can see the tip of his index finger, the same thing. Most of those patients, by the way, on dialysis have renal failure or diabetic patients. This guy presented to us like this. We took him to cath lab. He has short segment above the wrist of significant calcified lesion um, in, the, in his distal radial artery. The same, atherectomy with atherectomy device followed by balloon angioplasty, restored the flow. Then follow up, the surgeon took the necrotic tip of his index and completely healed. Another patient, you can see the tip of his index finger and middle finger. When we took him to cath lab, and he has one vessel run off to the hand through the radial artery with multiple severe stenotic lesions, heavily calcified as you can tell. The lesion crossed, atherectomy was performed, picture follow up after angioplasty, and that's what he got to his hand. Some of them, they don't come for follow up because they feel good. Uh, this is uh, one of the dramatic cases we've done. As you can tell, this is the left hand and on the right screen is the right hand. This gentleman start losing finger after finger and you can see he has a fresh surgery on his left thumb. <clears throat> the surgeon kept knocking off part of his hand every time he sees him because not much options surgically. So we brought him to cath lab and work on both hands. And as you can see, this is a radial artery, I'm sorry, this is an ulnar artery and the radial artery is almost completely occluded. After we work on both arms, you can see atherectomy, balloon angioplasty, that the result we almost restored the flow in all three major vessels to the hand. And that's what he got on the right side of the screen, the perfusion to the hand and um, I'm just going to show you how bad is the pain before after we did him. 
I can't play it, okay. It's not playing. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's when I saw him for follow-up. As you can see, all the wounds almost completely healed. What's sad about this patient, you can see his wheelchair, he has no legs also. So he lost his legs already and lost much of his hands. I'm going to bypass this case and this one for the sake of time. Um, this is an interesting case, as you can tell. The tip of the middle finger, necrotic, very painful, took this patient to calf lab. You can see in the radial artery, very distally, almost above the wrist, very high, uh, very severe calcified lesion blocking the flow completely to the hand. There is one here and another lesion here. This is, hopefully I can play the film. How can you play it? Let me see if I can play it. How do I do that? Two minutes, please. Okay. I'm trying to see if I can play this video. Okay. Okay. Nope. Let's go back. That's fine. Sorry. Okay. I'm having problem playing the videos on Zoom. I'm going to go back to this picture. Anyway, this is the atherectomy, and that's when did balloon angioplast way distal to that. Um, radial artery. This is another patient. You can see the thumb. And this is very interesting. I tried to go from both the groins. It, uh, she has occluded distal aorta. This is a distal aorta. So I went from the brachial artery in uh, retrograde fashion and took angiogram. This is the radial is occluded. And this is the ulnar where the lesion. She has one vessel runoff to the hand, which is the ulnar artery with lesion here. The only way I can reach it either from the left arm, which I tried, but it's very tortuous to go around to the right arm. So I decided to go retrograde from the ulnar artery and I went bareless without any sheath. So you can see my needle with my wire. This is my balloon angioplasty. And that's when we finished from, from uh, the case. We restored the flow in the ulnar artery. This is another case. You can see the tip of the thumb, um, necrotic. This patient had the alsa shunt had the mini stints put in, in her venous uh, side. You can see the brachial artery has short segment of severe calcified disease and barely any blood flow to the distal to the elbow. That's what she got to her hand, barely any blood. So we did atherectomy, balloon angioplasty. One minute. One minute. One minute. And that's what we got the flow restored to her finger. And this is like three months follow up, completely healed. Um, I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, this is, I'm just going to show you the last two cases. We did them last week. This is one of them. As you can tell, the surgeon tried, took the finger off and put some graft. It did not heal, so he asked me if I can do anything. You can see here the radial artery completely blocked off in the mid of its portion. Ulnar artery is gone. So we went through the radial artery, percutaneously, balloon angioplasty, and that's what we restored the flow to her hand. And this is the last case. You can see the hand. And this patient was brought to cath lab. If you look to close up here, you can see heavily calcified lesion in the distal radial and in the proximal palmar arch almost. And this is the major supply to the hand. So we took him to cath lab. We did balloon angioplasty, atherectomy to both lesions. And that's what we got the result. No follow up yet because we just did him last week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Barrow. I, I want to tell you that this brings us back home to how um, amazing, uh, what an opportunity we have to save limb, life and limb, um, uh, even in this COVID or without COVID, um, how, how great of a specialty interventional cardiovascular uh, training is, as well as cardiovascular surgery. So we thank you all for all of your great contributions. I want to hand it over to Dr. Halleck and uh, Dr. Krasier. Thank you all for giving me this opportunity to um, uh, represent 4TS uh, really to the world. Thank you so much. Take it away, Dr. Halleck and Dr. Krasier. Th th thank you so much, uh, Annie, for your great work of, um, of um, uh, mod um, moderating and uh, keeping everybody on, on track. Uh, thank you. It was a great job. And uh, thank you again for uh, not able to uh, kind of forgive us, not able to 
do your presentation tonight. Hopefully, we'll do it uh, soon. Next and, time. Uh, it's it's a, it's a great cardiologist, great person. She is coming, she planning to come and extend her office here to Dubai and to do the preventive uh, cardiology at the King's. Thank you again, yes. Dr. Annie. And uh, now, Dr. Krasier. Thank you, Omar. Uh, I think this was a very informative, educational uh, uh, webinar. I learned quite a bit. Uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, information that was provided to us about COVID. Uh, I think it's one of the most comprehensive uh, uh, webinars, and I participate a lot of them on uh, COVID-19. Uh, we have all learned a lot, and uh, we uh, hope we'll be able to continue with similar webinars uh, and also with uh, 40s meeting in February in Dubai, whether it's going to be uh, uh, virtual or a combination of virtual and uh, live. It's yet to be determined depending on the COVID situation and the vaccine issues that we are dealing with at the present time. But uh, let's be optimistic and uh, let's hope that we can address and resolve this problem before it happens because Big Inshallah. things are supposed to happen in Dubai. Uh, uh, next year is going to be a big year for, for Dubai and United Arab Emirates. So Omar, you might want to mention a few things about it. Why is we're, Dubai we're, going to be important for next year? We're, we're keeping it a surprise. So we'd like to everybody come to Dubai and see it, witness it themselves. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was great. And hopefully we'll meet all of you in mid-February here in Dubai. Uh, we will uh, keep in touch, in, in touch and then we'll... Uh, uh, it's going to be virtual or uh, hybrid or completely physical. I hope that we'll be able to make it uh, as, as normal in Dubai and we enjoy the uh, exciting city here in Dubai. Thank you again and sorry for being late tonight. It was very tight schedule, very rich one, uh, but I think I, I learned a lot myself and it was great. Thank you very much for all the speakers and for all our audience who stay with us to the end and uh, for even beyond. Thank you so much and uh, good night in Dubai time and uh, uh, good uh, morning, midday in uh, Houston and uh, other parts of the US. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Bye. Love you. Great job, Annie. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.